sure I can uh, do one to record that. Yep. So are we recording yet? We're, we're recording. We'll cut out this beginning bit. Okay, so this is the h Python script tutorial. Somehow we're going to hold this remotely. So Christina and I right now are in different locations, so if one of us loses internet or phone access, the other one can take over. Now Christina Holt, if you don't know, is my counterpart in the Developmental Testbed Center. She's in the h team over there. And I'm in the Environmental Modeling Center. I do the operational side of things, and she and the DTC do the uh, public support and some of the research. So we're going to share these presentations. She'll be doing about half of them, and I'll do the other half. And she'll start out with an overview of the h system at a high level. So please go ahead, Christina. Thanks, Sam. Um, so today we uh, really wanted to just cover everything for HWARF that we could possibly fit into an eight-hour day in, um, and address some of the needs that we know that some of you have um, that you've expressed either in terms of just telling us or asking questions from the help desk or um, you know, any other avenue of communication that we have open to all of you. So um, we really wanted to cover these Python scripts in depth, and a lot of this is going to be a repeat of what we did in Miami, but um, with the idea that the more times you hear it and see it, maybe the, the more clear it becomes, and uh, picking up little things here and there along the way is, uh, is good if you missed it last time. Um, or if you saw it last time and then this time added clarity. So that's what our goal is here. Um, it is a very complex system and it keeps growing. It grew uh, extensively in the last few weeks even. So, um, you know, it's just something that you really have to stay on top of and uh, repetitive trainings can sometimes help with that. So um, we know that as we continue to get funding for developers and uh, a bigger community has a greater need to know the details of this complex system. So we want to continue to offer, um, continue to, to offer, <laughs> sorry, I keep getting pop-ups that um, somebody else wants to be the presenter right now. Um, so the agenda for today, uh, I sent out a while back, we're doing 20 to 30 minute talks all day with a couple of breaks in there so that we can maybe catch up on time or get some uh, more caffeine and um, and watch the snowfall depending on where you are. So uh, we're going to go through just an overview of the system and uh, look then at some of the internals. So how everything is communicating within HWRF and in, in more depth than just a general overview. Uh, I'll I'll give the talk on object oriented scripts this time. Uh, and then we added some information to go into more detail about uh, the prod util package. Um, and then after the break, we'll talk about the logs in a little bit more depth than we did last time, along with a new topic, troubleshooting, that Sam added, um, and configuring. Then after lunch, uh, we'll talk about Rakoto database and debugging, as we did in Miami, and then um, after the break, we will discuss uh, adding a workflow component and some of the, the considerations to make when you need to do something like that. So the first thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, just an overview of the, the resources that developers have. Um, so that includes a lot of documentation, including the user support web page. I know this is uh, just the public release that is documented here, uh, but we do have a lot of good information about the, the components there. Could you please are. mute your phones, everybody? We're getting a lot of feedback, and it's because of the phones are muted. So please do that. Thank you. Thanks, Gus. All right. Then uh, we also have the scientific documentation. If you want to know more uh, science-related 
stuff about all of the components of HWERF. We have a lot of information there from the developers of those uh, different components. Um, we have the user's guide, like I mentioned. It has a, a whole lot of good content in there, uh, including how to install, how to run from a user perspective. And this, again, does focus mostly on the uh, 3.7 public release, but it does have uh, general good information in there for running. Uh, the HWARF developers website is going to be uh, a good place to go for uh, quite a bit of information, including the repository uh, information that you might need, getting started, and how to even build the system. A lot of the documents and support uh, that we've done with presentations and that kind of thing are all posted there. The slides for this meeting will also go up there um, when I'm done here. So um, we have an FAQ that I update pretty often as we start getting uh, really relevant questions from, from uh, developers. I'll throw them here um, with the answers if we have them or just a general uh, we don't know what's going on and we're working on it uh, kind of thing. So uh, <laughs> that doesn't happen very often, but that kind of information is here in the FAQ. Um, we also have a lot of communications, like you're not alone in this process. We have the developers committee. We meet every uh, two weeks or, or as close to every two weeks as we can lately. Um, I think that's going to get back on track. Um, and that just provides a forum for discussion of um, all the plans and updates for development and that kind of thing happening in, um, in the repository. And uh, we can also discuss that on the mailing list, hwerf underscore developers. And um, that goes out to the same group of people. Uh, I typically send out uh, the the minutes for each of the meetings after we hold the meeting. So if you can't make it to the the noon meeting every month, every other Monday, then the notes are are there for you to reference and and ask questions about later. We also have an amazing Doxygen website that is full of content about everything in HWERF, um, and I encourage you all to to definitely check this out and make it a a go-to website for any information that you have um, or need to know about HWERF. It should be in there. If it's not, then um, let us know and um, we'll try to fill in the gaps. So um, as far as general Python guidance and help, um, you can check out the uh, Python release webpage and um, and you want to make sure that you're looking for the documentation for the 2.6.6 .6 release. Um, we're using that. Christina? For, yes. Christina, you're not changing your slides. Is that intentional? Uh, no, not at all. I should be on slide 11 right now. And yeah, you're we seeing don't. slide one. This whole time? Man. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I thought something was a little funky too, but I thought you were you were just giving a long intro. Um, no, no, I was on level at this point. It literally, sorry. It literally just updated for us here at HRD. Oh dear. On slide, slide eleven. Okay, are you I guess seeing? it doesn't like doesn't like presentation mode. Maybe. Um, let's see if I can go back to presentation mode and it helps. So, are you oh. seeing slide 11 now? Yeah, but uh, we're slide. seeing slide 11. Try going to 12. I'm on 12. Yeah, we don't see that oh. in presentation mode. Okay, this should be fun. Let's actually. Maybe it's because I'm. Let's try this. Um, so this is slide 11 and slide 12. Yeah, we can see you moving back and forth between them now. Okay, I think it was because I just had you guys on uh, my PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, last little bit of information here about where you can find help. And um, I did have slides for each of those things um, in the presentation. Again, I'll post all of these on the the. GTC website for developers. 
Um, so for general Python help, you can go to the 2.6.6 release notes, and uh, there's a lot of information there um, at docs.python.org. Make sure that you're looking for documentation for the 2.6.6 release, because that is the only version available on the NOAA machines. Um, so that is what we're using here for HWARF. In the future, we uh, may have 2.7, uh, because it's the long-term support release, but uh, we're not using version 3. It's basically a different language. So um, if you do need some other um, information just while you're using Python, you can always type in the command help with the thing that you need help with in parentheses, and it should give you some information about that thing. So here I've provided an example for getting help with the, a Python list, and that should give you some, some good information there. So uh, I do want to get into the actual HWORF system overview and talk a little bit about the um, system design, the jobs of each task, and some common configurations uh, that are available uh, with uh, many of the capabilities that, that we have in the trunk. Uh, so there are six layers for the scripts that are responsible for preparing uh, many, many, I think uh, as of last night it was 118 uh, executables for submission to the system and uh, running, and then most of these layers are written in object-oriented Python um, code uh, the, that makes it highly configurable and really reduces the footprint of the system drastically. So uh, these six layers Sam has outlined in the online documentation and I'm uh, referencing those same words here but I wanted to clarify what these words really mean. So if we're talking about an inner cycle layer uh, that means Rakoto, wrappers, EC flow, whatever we're using to run the system. This layer is going to handle the interactions between several cycles. So there are complex dependencies depending on um, what ran already in operations, what needs to run still, um, the files that are passed between those different cycles. Uh, archiving and scrubbing also has uh, have to be handled. Uh, the cool thing is Rakodo or EC Flow if you're in um, in NCO running the model operationally, take care of all of these things. So uh, it's not really needed to have Rakodo or EC Flow if you're just running one case study. You can run each component uh, by hand, but if you're running a large retrospective study, um, you really do need one of these automation systems. And um, definitely for real-time autom automation, it's critical. Um, we also reference Rakoto, the wrappers, and EC flow when we're talking about the workflow layer. Um, and it's kind of kind of uh, subtle how we make the distinction between these two, but uh, really the workflow is what's going to be splitting the work into multiple batch jobs. Um, it handles the dependencies on each task or job as it's being submitted um, and keeps track of uh, where the job is um, as far as has it been submitted, did it fail, do we need to submit it again, how many times can we resubmit it, those types of things. So we'll talk more in depth about those in later talks. Uh, the scripting layer is everything in the scripts directory and they're all named exhworth something.py and um, the purpose layer is that it loads the program and libraries into the computing environment, ensures a connection to the file system from the compute node that you're working on. It passes the file and executable locations to the next lower layer for the experiment. And um, still, we're talking about an optional layer. Uh, you can do everything below this layer manually, but the scripting layer really does um, help with the automation and being able to easily submit these jobs. So uh, if we move on to the experiment layer, this is uh, one, basically uh, this one file defines uh, all the objects needed to run HWARF. So this is HWARF underscore EXPT 
.py, it lives in the USH directory, um, and it describes the entire workflow. It creates the object structure that connects all the pieces. Um, and mm -hmm. just a couple of examples here. Um, it, it tells us where we should get input from each, uh, for each job and from what job we should do that. So GSI should use input from the GDAS relocation output, and that's defined in this file. And um, each object has a run function to perform the actual task, and that's uh, in the next lower le level. Um, so then we have the implementation layer, and that here is included in USH slash HWARF for most of the components, and then the POM package is USH POM. Um, and these files are just a set of Python classes and functions used by the experiment layer to run. So it's actually the definition of how we're going to run the HWARF. I can still hear somebody in the background. If you don't mind everybody muting uh, your microphone, that would be fantastic. So um, I just wanted to also mention about the USH uh, implementation scripts that um, each component has its own class and set of functions. Some of those uh, classes perform utilities that support the system, the HWRF system, uh, such as uh, the file, uh, setting the file names, predicting the file names, uh, doing some kind of uh, date, time, arithmetic, those kind of support utilities. Um, and others are really, how do I run uh, a particular component? So um, it's just a matter of what you're dealing with there as far as uh, what what kind of tasks each of these uh, modules perform. So uh, we do have two packages here. POM is the Princeton Ocean Model Initialization uh, set of scripts, and then HWARF is the implementation of most of the rest of the HWARF system. Lastly, we have a portability layer, and this is um, going to be talked about in depth in a later talk, as I mentioned earlier but it really acts to implement cross-platform methods for performing common tasks. So um, I just list a whole bunch of different common tasks we might be performing, but this is really related to, you know, uh, more computer-related uh, things that you would be able to do, like in a shell script or something like that. Um, so I've been busy making fun... Um, flow diagrams lately, and I tried to capture as many of the HWORF tasks as I could that happen in the Rakoto or even the EasyFlow uh, workflow here. And this kind of captures uh, a snapshot of running an Atlantic storm uh, in, with the full configuration as it's uh, set up. I'm not going to try to go through all of these. I hope that it's kind of <laughs> clear as mud um, what's happening here. But I will say that I tried to set this up so that arrows are pointing to um, the, next, uh, the next task that can run. And uh, it's kind of set up more on dependencies than it is on... Uh, data flow. So it's not necessarily just a data flow chart, but um, definitely dependencies have to be met for each of these tasks before it can move on to the next task. For instance, uh, the launcher must run before every other task can be run. Um, if we're talking about running a forecast, then everything above the forecast has to be completed before the forecast can run. Um, but most of these things go into the check and net before it goes into the, the forecast. So this is kind of how I was thinking about this as I was setting this up. Uh, I could spend a lot of time on this, this chart explaining how things interact and that kind of thing, but this is just uh, not what I, I necessarily meant uh, putting it on this slide. I just wanted you to see that there is a, a complex dependency relationship between all of these tasks that are running in the workflow. Um, so uh, a few things I do want to mention here is that uh, there is an ensemble uh, that is running now, and I wanted to clarify that the ensemble forecast was started from the GFS ensemble 
of the previous cycle when the TDR is available for the current cycle. So um, that gets fed into a relocation if you want to relocate the ensemble members, um, and that goes into to GSI. If you have TDR in the next cycle, then you'll start an ensemble in this cycle and uh, then write a done file. So um, just wanted to mention that and then descriptions of each of these tasks are available in the Doxygen documentation. So um, if you are interested in what each of these does, the dependencies on the task and that kind of thing, check out the Doxygen documentation on the web page. It's also included in the scripts. Um, I also wanted to mention that each of these boxes is related to uh, either a, a Rakota workflow component, uh, an EC workflow component. Uh, some of them have wrappers, some of them don't, just because we do not support every one of these, um, these tasks in the public release, but uh, many of them do have wrappers. The scripts and Python classes that go with them are all documented as well. Um, so lots of information about each of these boxes, so I'm going to leave this uh, jumbled mess with you guys to kind of like walk through on your own. I wanted to point out that there are some different uh, configurations happening in each basin and they're changing between 2015 and 2016. So uh, the 2015 defaults um, have uh, different configuration files that we can use for each basin and we set a slightly different configuration. So we're always running data assimilation um, in the Atlantic uh, with the 3D Palm. We use an ensemble when there's uh, tail Doppler radar data. Uh, we use 61 vertical levels in the forecast model with a 2 millibar model top. Um, and then we do have an hworf underscore al.conf and it stays empty. I apologize, that should say um, it's a 2015 al.conf here. Um, again, this information is available on the Doxygen website. Uh, so in the East Pack, we're only running data simulation when there's TDR data. Otherwise, it's turned off, um, and we do run that ensemble in that case. Everything else is the same as the, the Atlantic. Um, in all the other basins, we turn off uh, the ocean, the data simulation, and definitely the ensemble. And, uh, and then everywhere except for the North Central Pacific, we're running with 43 vertical levels in the forecast model with a 50 millibar model top. Um, the things that are changing in 2016, uh, notice that there, there are some name changes in the, the comp files themselves um, from 2015 to uh, not labeled as a year, but uh, now we are also running an ensemble in the North Central Pacific or plan to, um, and then again we're keeping this uh, pretty similar set up in the Northeast Pacific. Um, the, I wanted to simplify this workflow just a little bit. I know that this is still a pretty um, complex arrangement of dependencies and that kind of thing, but I just wanted to, to show you that we have a couple of different uh, workflows. So I just described all of the things that we turn on and off in uh, different, different basins but uh, this kind of shows visually what I meant by that. So if we're working with the storm in the Atlantic or the East Pack that has TDR data, we're going to go through each of these steps, starting with launcher. We're going to grab the input. We're going to run the initialization on GFS and GDAS, along with the ocean initialization, and if we need to um, run relocation on the ensemble from the previous forecast, uh, or we're going to start an ensemble for the next forecast if that one has TDR data. Uh, we do vortex initialization before we do data assimilation in the GSI uh, domains two and three steps. We merge all that information together and run a coupled forecast. After that, we run UPP, we get products, we archive those products, and then we delete them all. So that's kind of uh, the overview of, of this diagram. Um, if we are running without TDR in the Atlantic, some of these things drop off and we have a little bit simpler 
uh, workflow. So in this case, we're performing data assimilation with ensemble covariances that come from the global ensemble, so there's not as much to do as far as prep work for that. So um, we get to get rid of all of those boxes. And then in the East Pack, um, if we have uh, no TDR, then it becomes pretty uh, simple here. And we get to get rid of the entire leg that has the GDAS initialization. And we just do GFS initialization with Vortex relocation and then um, ocean initialization. In every other basin, it gets even simpler. We're not running the ocean either, so we're just relocating the GFS uh, vortex before submitting an uncoupled forecast and doing all of those other things. Uh, we also use the lower vertical resolution, as I mentioned a couple slides ago. So there are many other uh, configurations available that we're still supporting in uh, the HWARF trunk. So we you can run the full system in all the basins if you want to. Uh, you can run at lower horizontal resolution with the 2793 uh, that we were running with a couple years back. Then uh, you can run with the lower vertical structure if you'd like. Uh, the GEFS-based HWARF ensemble is available to run in any base, um, well, to run um, all the time if you would like. Then uh, you can set different forecast links, physics schemes, um, disable different components uh, as you would like. You don't have to do the one set for the basins. Um, you can run without spectral files if you need to, and there's also a multi-storm capability that can be turned on. Again, uh, check out the Docs and website. I've provided a, a link here for all the available configurations. So that's all I have for the overview. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions we have, but we're going to go more in depth about these configurations and such um, in the rest of the talk today. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Hi, Christine. Uh, this is Juan from my Hi. Yeah, I have a question. So can the workflow for like North Atlantic Basin can modify to now using like such as now using GSI? or other procedure, just like simple GFS initialization and run work. Um, I'm sorry. You were breaking up just enough that I couldn't quite. Can you repeat the question? OK, so my question is, you list that you give a like, few configuration, like workflow, uh, to run in different basins. So for North Atlantic, you go through a series like EA, GSI, and ocean, whatever. But for uh, some other basin, it's really simple, just GFS side, just G GFS and Warhack initialization, then run each work, right? Yes. So can, can I use that configuration for the Atlantic Basin? Oh, absolutely. Um, so you can set any of these configurations for any basin that you choose to. Um, and just the system automatically sets uh, a configuration per basin for you. Um, but you can send up those files um, manually to be able to set up that configuration in any basin. So if you wanted the, the Westpac configuration in the Atlantic, it's just an, an additional one file that you would set um, for the launcher. Once okay, that, thank you. yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Did anybody else have any other questions? Christina, I just have one clear question. Um, you, I know you said you're going to post a copy of this presentation somewhere. Is it available right now for us to download or not? Um, it is not available on the website yet, um, although if you have a NOAA email address, then um, you can get it from the Google site. Um, get, it, and I can, get it from where? Uh, we do have it in a Google Drive um, right now. Okay. Uh, I can work, actually while um, Sam's presenting, I can work on getting them posted to the, the DPC website. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so um, 
I am going to give Sam control so that he can present the internals talk. Um, and let's see if this works. Are you going to do it, Christina? Um, yes. Okay, perfect. It looks like you did. Did you, did you get it, Sam? So can anyone see my screen? You can see HWARF internals in the middle of the screen. We see it here on HRD. Okay, now let me see if my slideshow version works. Do you see over? Do you see overview now? You should see my overview slide. Yes. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, Christina, are you working on posting the slides online? Yeah. Do I need to do anything special? I don't know. Put them on your favorite website. Okay. Because I've seen several requests at the top of my screen for the slides to be posted. All yeah, right. I'll so I'm going to. I'll talk about how the internals of the HWARF scripting system work. You just got an overview of how they look from a high level. So I'm on slide three, which shows you the various major pieces of the HWARF system. Now, the HWARF system is designed to be independent of the choice of workflow system, or even independent of the choice of not having a workflow system. So if you look at the top three bubbles, EasyFlow, JJobs, and Rakodo, those are actually optional. You can pick one, the other, or neither, and the system will still work the exact same way. And below that, you can see the various levels that implement the actual internal logic of the HORF. The bottom left is Python itself, which handles most of the scripting. And bottom right is the executables, which handle most of the logic. We use almost no executables outside of the HWARF system. There's a few we take from NWPod if we run in operations, but even those we don't need on other machines. They're compiled internally in the HWARF build system. The one and only executable we need outside of HWARF is the Python interpreter, for which we usually use the C Python implementation of Python from version 2.6.6 .6 or 2.6.9 on the praise. So on this next slide, it, I'm showing you independently how the EC flow based system and uh, on the slide after this, the Rakodo based system work. So in EC flow, there's an EC flow server process running on either an EC flow dedicated node or a front end node somewhere. The EC flow reads a set of dependencies, each of which refers to an ECF script, which is a simple batch script that, that ECFlow submits to the batch system. Those ECF scripts set a few environment variables and call a JJobs script, which is another simple batch script. And all that JJob does is set a few more environment variables, finds a Python interpreter, and tells it to call the EX script. And in general, you need to set some environment variables or pass arguments to tell that EX script what to do, even if you run the EX script manually. So Rakodo works similarly. Instead of having a server, the Rakodo has a cron job that you run. It keeps track of history based on a SQLite3 database file. And instead of being event-driven like EasyFlow, Rakodo is dependency driven. So it'll every time you run the main Rakodo run program, Rakodo will query the batch system to see what jobs have succeeded or failed, and it'll check data dependencies such as file sizes and existence. And instead of having a dependencies ECF file, it has an XML file with the dependencies. But in the end, it's the same. Instead of having a J job that sets variables and calls the EX script, there's an XML file that tells Rakodo what to run. Now, everything below the scripts level, actually from the scripts level on down, is identical. Now, the scripts level itself is also optional. You can run directly using a, an interactive Python program. We'll go over that a little bit later today. 
internally in the scripts, each one of these EX scripts loads the EXPT and alerts modules. Actually, alerts is only loaded in jobs that have... Could people mute their phones, please? I'm getting a lot of feedback from the background. So the HWARF EXPT module has a complex object structure describing the entire end-to-end -end HWARF system. And the EXPT module itself does not actually have any of the classes defined. All it does is describe what is to be run. The real implementation is in the HWARF and POM and PyCom Python packages, which contain many modules with the actual logic. And then once the script loads and sets up that module, it just calls the run function in one or more objects inside that module. And we'll go over what all of that means later today. So down in the OOSH layer, there is HWARF and POM packages, which have the high and middle level logic about how to run the HWARF system. This is built on top of a prod util module, which has low-level logic, like how to run a program, and, of course, the HWARF executables, which do the heavy lifting. Now, the prod util package performs basic functions, like it knows how to make symbolic links, how to copy files, how to run a program, and it works around known bugs in Python itself. It sits on top of the Python core libraries. And I'll talk about the various main directories in the HWARF system. In the top left, you see work HWARF, which I believe that variable is capital data in the NCO system. That's where we put all of our temporary files. In the bottom left, com or com out or com HWARF, that's where the final files are delivered. There's also DBN alerts that are triggered to tell other parts of the NSEP workflow to deliver files to the FTP pod website or wherever else. Now on the right side, you see my big home HWARF box. That is where the HWARF is actually installed. You can see PARM and six at the top. Those have parameter files. Six directory usually has the big ones and farm has the small ones. Oosh has the main implementation of HWARF. Script has the top level implementation. XX contains all of the HWARF programs except the ones in NWPOD. The bottom left, ECF, contains the ECFlow workflow. Bottom middle is the jobs, which contains the uh, stuff just below the EC flow level that knows how to run each script. Then bottom right, Rokodo has the XML document that tells Rokodo the dependencies and job cards. It essentially duplicates the information in ECF and jobs, but in the syntax that Rokodo understands. Now, six and Parm, those contain the small and big configuration files, the things that either don't change from cycle to cycle or documents that are used to automatically generate name lists that can vary. The fixed directory usually has the large binary files. The PARM directory has files that are used directly, but it also contains files that are passed through our HWARF configuration system to generate name lists and other input data automatically from the files. The comp files themselves are also in the PARM directory. The HWARF configuration system is built off of a whole bunch of Unix comp files, as well as the Python config parser module, which knows how to read them. And we have a number of Python functions and classes that know how to automatically substitute that information into whatever you need, GSI name lists, WARF name lists file names, that sort of thing. So here's a, a diagram of how configuration works. I know this is a complicated slide, but we do have a 40-minute presentation on this later on. 
So on the left, you can see the contents of the Parm directory. There's five comp files read in in order. And the bottom left, you can see you can also specify specific files and options to override these. The top middle is the only job that ever reads in these comp files from Parm, the launcher job. It reads in the files. It generates an in-memory comp file that contains all of that information. It then can override some of the information depending on the base and the time of year and such. And then it writes out the final file to the com directory as storm1 or storm2 or whatever storm it is .conf. Each H4 storm has one comp file and each cycle has its own comp files. That allows you to override the configuration on a per cycle, per storm basis in emergencies, such as, for example, turning off spectral data processing or GSI to recover from unexpected failures in the upstream model or data transfer issues to JET. Now, on the right, you see what happens in all of the jobs except the launcher job. It'll read in the storm number.conf and generate in memory HWARF launcher objects, which is a subclass of HWARF config. And that object contains all of the configuration information and it knows how to generate derived information from that. There's helper functions in many other classes to query and use this configuration information. And there's a dedicated module hwarf.namelist for generating Fortran name lists from comp files. Now I'm going to go on to a slightly related topic, which is tasks and products. This is part of how we deliver data and keep track of who generates that data. Now a product is anything deliverable. Usually it's a file, possibly multiple files together. Sometimes there's metadata. For example, if you're delivering a native grid grib file, then there is also metadata describing the grid. And there may be additional index files delivered along with the grib file itself. Now a task is anything that consumes and produces these products. And it has a well-defined way of listing the products it produces, running itself, and in some cases, unrunning itself, which is canceling out the effect the task had so that you can ensure the run function will do, redo everything, even if the task is restartable. So here is an example of some products and tasks. This is probably the most, well, maybe second most complex dependency in the entire H4 system forecast. You can see on the left, it needs a whole bunch of inputs from the HWARF initialization. And on the right, you can see, hopefully you see my cursor, you can see it generates a whole bunch of WARF out files and three WARF diag files. The WARF out files have to go to the non-satellite post. And there's also a satellite post not displayed here that produces a whole bunch of native grid native grid grib files, which are sent to a regridding task that produces many more pressure grib files. Some of those are sent to the tracker, which generates a track. And then the track and WARF diag files are sent to the HWARF EXDT NHCP task, which generates some custom output for NHC. Now, you don't need to understand all of this now. We're going to tell you about it in more detail later. But one thing you should notice is that this is an incredibly complex dependency. And keeping track of this many files would drive you insane if you tried to do it manually. So how do we keep track of this many files? Now, the typical approaches that are done in KSH-based systems are these. You can, if you have a dependency that you're waiting for, you can run stat on a file if you know the file name or if you just know the uh, template for the file name, like 126star.grv, then you have to run ls minus l star dot, uh, 126star.grv. That is an extremely heavy use of the file system metadata, which is straining some of our NOAA file systems to the limit. Another way is to generate flag files so that you can just stack the flag file. That is not as hard as ls minus l star dot whatever, but it's still very hard on the 
metadata. Some scripts, instead of waiting for an operation, if you need the operation in 100 places, they'll just rerun the operation in 100 places if it's a cheap operation. That way CPU and IO and sometimes those cheap operations can be much heavier on the metadata and data aspects of the file system than you think. Another example is post-processing. If you look at the GFS post-processing, you'll see that it runs the post and then it runs a whole bunch of serial regridding operations, which wastes all of the processors except one while doing the regridding. Instead, we split it out into a post and then a whole bunch of regridding tasks, all of which run in parallel. And we're able to do that due to a database. Now, this database makes things a lot cheaper as long as you have a database implementation. So what is a database? A database is just a table with rows, one row for each product or task. We have two tables. One has the availability and location. The other one has metadata for the products and tasks. And this is implemented using the SQLite 3 library, which is a very simple database implementation. There's more sophisticated ones like Oracle or MySQL PostgreSQL, which have more capabilities but require a dedicated server. Now this approach allows us to communicate availability instantly between jobs. So when our post job generates our egrid grib file, all of our 10 or so regribbers instantly know that that happened and they can start regridding that post file. Not only that, but there's multiple different regridding operations that can happen at once on the same file since we have multiple different target grids and the regridders know who is running which aspect of the regridding automatically. So we also have support for primary and backup data sources. I'm giving an example of this from the wharf which can get its outer domain initial state file from one of three different locations if you're doing the Atlantic configuration. The ideal location is to get it from the GDAS merge, which is where it comes from if data simulation succeeds. If that fails, then we can get the main outer domain file from the GFS analysis vortex relocation step, which still does a decent forecast skill. And if that fails, we can get it straight from the GFS analysis, which is not ideal. I think in up in uh, the trunk, we actually have that last one disabled since we'd rather have the workflow fail than run without any relocation or data assimilation. Now, internally, this generates a Python list which contains three objects, each of which knows how to get the input from one location. And when the, when the forecast or check in a job want to run, they go to each of those objects in sequence picking the first one that has the data available. Now that is set up to intentionally fail unless you turn on the fallbacks flag. In operations, the fallback, fallbacks flag is on by default. In R&D, we keep it off so that we can detect unintended failures. Now, speaking of fallbacks, the, there are many jobs and most of them have fallback options in case things failed. One example, is that the forecast will run without ocean coupling if the ocean in it fails. And of course you can get more input from the GFS analysis relocation in the Atlantic if the Atlantic data assimilation fails. Some of them are enabled automatically when you do allow fallback equals yes, but some of them are not enabled automatically and have to be done manually by editing the comp file for the cycle and resubmitting the job. Oh, that's my last slide. So do we have any questions about the internals? If that was a question, I didn't hear it. So if there's no question, I guess we'll go on to the next presentation. I understand. Excuse me, I think someone needs to mute their phone, please.
sorry, I need to bring up the agenda. It's uh, object oh. oriented. All right. It says that's you, so go ahead, Christina. Okay. Um, you want to give me control of the screen? I'm also, not sure I want how I just stopped sharing. Uh -oh. Do you have control? No. Who has control? Here, I can I can take over uh, and and set it back to Christina. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks. Let me know right. how you get it. I got it. Um, and let's see. This one's a PDF. I, uh, uh, hey, Kachin, can you mute your your uh, microphone, please? Um, let's see. Slideshow. Um, I wanted to mention before I get started that I did get all of the the PDF files posted on the DTC website under the documentation um, tab. I was just finishing that up as uh oh as I was um, as I, I was being called to talk again. So I'll send the link out after this presentation. But those um, are there if you know where the the DTC website is um, for the HWARF developers, then uh, you can go grab those PDFs from that website. So um, this is going to be a talk about the object-oriented scripting in Python, and um, it's uh, mostly the, the slides that Sam talked about while we were in Miami, so it may be a review for many of you, but um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I um, just want to talk a little bit about what object-oriented means, how it's implemented in Python, and then um, scripting in Python with HWERF um, using a unified post example, and then a little bit about exception handling, um, but just an overview there. So. Uh, we need to talk a little bit about some of the words I'll be using here. Um, as far as object-oriented programming goes, what is an object? And that just means that it's a, a logical grouping of functions and data so that we can, we can do things um, in the scripts. And then a class is a blueprint for making an object, so um, how we're setting this object up. So these are just a, a few terms that I'll be using while talking about these different things. So if we talk about an example here, we could talk about a square. Uh, a square has some width and it has a color. In this case, um, it's got a, some unit list width of three with a blue color. Um, and it could have some functions. We know some things or how to define some things based on the width of the square, um, such as the perimeter. We know that the perimeter is going to be four times that width. Um, an area would be the width times the width. So that um, we could calculate some other things about the square if we needed to. We do that with the use of functions. Uh, we could also have a circle. Again, uh, we know a couple of things about the circle. It has a radius and a color. Um, and given that we know its radius, we can define a function um, for the perimeter or the area here as well, because both of these things um, have, uh, have different ways to define those things. We can um, then talk about uh, setting up specific uh, object-oriented programming scripts for those guys. So they both have colors. They have a perimeter and an area, and they're calculated in different ways. Uh, so they are definitely both shapes. So we can talk about defining a shape class. In this case, um, a shape has a color, it has a perimeter, and it has an area. But um, we don't necessarily know what general shape uh, is going to be happening, so um, 
we can't really define a, a general perimeter or area for any given shape that could possibly exist. Um, but we could say that we can um, give it a color, like any shape could have any color, um, and it doesn't depend on the shape at all. So we have this idea of giving a shape a color um, as its data, but we have unknown function for perimeter and area because we don't know what the shape is. Um, and those are called virtual functions. So um, in order to know what the perimeter or area is, you have to know more about what the shape is that you're defining. So in this example, uh, square and circle are subclasses of shape. Um, shape implements the color, so everybody here is blue, but then um, the square and the circle need to know how to calculate their own perimeter and area uh, given their radius or width. So um, the because we have that information about those two shapes were able to uh, define more definite um, definite functions to calculate the those values. So um, again a circle has a radius if we're looking at the circular example. I want to make sure that everybody is seeing my slides move while I'm talking about all of this. We can see it move here at HRD. Fantastic. Uh, this would have been horribly uh, awful had you not been seeing what I was seeing. Okay, um, so uh, now we have functions uh, for the circle, but we've inherited uh, the color blue because it's a shape. Um, so we're only defining specifically the radius data for uh, the circle. The, sh the color blue was defined by the shape class. So um, I also wanted to point out that uh, all of the object-oriented objects are an instance of some class. So um, here on the left side of the screen, we have our blue circle that we've been talking about. We have our blue square. But if I implemented those as orange circles or pink squares, then those are different objects that we can do things to. And they also have their functions and radius and width data stored within them so that we can have um, many objects to work with here based on that one set of definitions that we were given and defining the data within the shape. So these all, or within, um, I'm sorry, within the class. Okay, so here is what it's going to look like if we're talking about implementing this in Python. Uh, we mentioned that we wanted uh, people to have a general idea of, of uh, Python scripting, but this is kind of just the, the outline of what I just talked about in Python. So if we define a, a shape class, we can um, also initialize it with some color that we set and, and initialize the shape with. It can be any color, like I mentioned on the previous slide. We want to uh, define a couple of different uh, functions here. Color uh, is just going to return the color that we set in the initialization um, function up above. The perimeter and area here are not implemented as we talked about because we don't know for shape what uh, a perimeter or area means. So those are just not implemented in this class. If we implement uh, the class circle, uh, we want to bring in everything we know about um, everything about a shape. So uh, we're using the shape information here in the class definition, and we initialize by um, initializing with some color for the circle. And we set a radius here, given the the init value radius. We then uh, are able to define functions for perimeter and area because we know what a circle uh, has in terms of a perimeter and an area. So we can set those here as uh, calculations to do those uh, 
those functions. So if we move on to actually constructing the object-oriented mechanics, um, here we have a square class. So um, the underscore, underscore, new, underscore, underscore, and uh, the same for init are built-in functions. They're going to uh, define, uh, they're going to be run the first time a uh, square class is implemented and uh, set up everything that you need to uh, to uh, instantiate your, your object. Um, and then define your color area perimeter of a square class. So then you can name, um, you can give it an easier name. So if we just want to talk about squares in terms of an S, you can start your, uh, your object with S equals square and give it all the information you need and now you can refer to it as S later on in the script. So the first time you do this, you're going to run the new and uh, underscore uh, underscore init uh, functions of square and shape here because we're um, using the subclass situation. So the Square object then gets initiated, or, or or you make a snapshot of one of those uh, blue circles. Sorry, squares. You're making a blue square of a uh, of uh, radius three or width three in this case, and um, you have all of that defined and it's used uh, later on. So all of that is available to you as a square at that point through mechanics of, of Python. So I want to give you a little bit of an overview of how we would actually think about using this for maybe an, uh, modeling, from a modeling perspective. Uh, the unified post um, is a post processor that can be run on many different models. And uh, it's run the same way every time. The only difference is that you have to, to set a few different things in a file called itag. So um, if you define your unified post uh, class and initialize it, giving it uh, the in file that it needs, uh, some fixed files that it needs, uh, tell it what executable to run and uh, the time, then it's going to run the same way every single time. It just needs to know about this idea of uh, what information to put in an itag file. Every time it runs, it'll link the fixed files, make the itag um, file, and then link in your, your input files and fixed files that you need. And then it's going to run. Um, so we have to define how we're linking in the files. Those are the same. Um, all the time. But then the make itag file is where things start to diverge a little bit. That is where we can really say, all right, we're reusing this whole script, but we want to change this one little thing depending on the uh, depending on the model that we're using. So we can define a couple of different make itag functions that depend on what model we, we use. So if we're using hworf, uh, we set a class hwork post, it's a subclass of the unified post, and um, define the make itag function for hwork. Um, in, in the hwork situation, we're going to write in um, strings, uh, I believe it's four lines in the itag file, and the thing that, that is important here is that at the end of this file, we're going to say that we have an NMM nest. That is the, the flag in the file that's telling UPP what model we're running. If we wanted to also have the option of running UPP on NIMS, um, we can also make an itag uh, function for NIMS. And the thing that differs here is that when we write the itag file, the last argument in the file is going to say NIMS instead of NMM nest. That's how UPP knows that we're running it with uh, NIMS output. So 
the idea here is that uh, we have these objects that we're defining um, and using the classes either unified post with nims post or unified post with hwork post. And that's going to tell us what object is running. And when we run that object, uh, we'll know that we're what model we're running for and know which make iTag to use. So um, skipping ahead a little bit to what if something fails, we're going to be talking about um, failures in HR specifically, but I just wanted to mention that Python set up nicely so that um, it has try, accept, and finally blocks so that if something does fail, it's easier to handle that. And we call that grouping exception handling. So uh, the way it's set up is that we have this try block. So it says um, try something. This block of code, um, it may break. It may succeed. So if it breaks, we're going to go into the accept, um, accept options here. So um, if you have just a general exception class, you would print something broke and, um, and, and move on. Um, maybe if something broke in a different way, you can say something else broke. So um, it, it gives you more detailed information of what exactly is causing a problem. And then uh, finally, you would do whatever is in this finally block. Uh, whether it broke or not, and uh, those two finally and accept are optional, but you can definitely, um, I mean, you definitely need to include one of them. So uh, this is just a way of handling when we have failures and we can define these exceptions in ways that are meaningful to us when we're writing these scripts. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how uh, we can define those exceptions. Um, all of them, all of the exceptions are objects, and Python comes with predefined classes of these exceptions. Uh, it's important to remember that you should never raise a base exception, um, but raise the subclasses of the exception when possible. So the base exception uh, includes exceptions uh, from the keyboard interrupts or system exits. It also includes environment error, error, oh my goodness, environment errors, key errors, and type errors. Um, so you really get an idea of uh, where your error is coming from. And there are many others that we don't list here, but uh, it, it can help you to really find out what's going wrong in your script. Um, if we talk a little bit about the object-oriented scripting for HWERF, uh, we can say go into a little bit more depth here, but we will talk about this plenty in the rest of the talks. Um, so here the idea is that in HWERF expt.py, we are instantiating an object post. Um, and we do that using HWERF post, which is defined uh, in, in the the USH scripts, and uh, give it our path to our input file, our fixed directory, uh, and uh, our executable, and then something about the when when it's running, so the date string. Then uh, we want to use the script to run uh, the run function for that object that we just created. So uh, we import hwerf expt, which is where we're uh, defining our post object in the init module, and then we run that post object using the run function. Um, so then we have all of that set up so that we can, we can use our workflow manager of choice to, uh, to run the new ex script that we have set up. Um, so this this is just a little tiny bit of how this is all connected and how we actually use this for uh, one one component of of HWERF. So um, we have a lot more information about these 
things, how we use it for many different components. We'll talk today about how to add a component and um, look at some of some of these type of things. Um, are there any questions uh, about this this talk or any any other material that we've seen so far? Hi, Terry McGinnis had a question. Let me make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Uh, he wants to know if the SQLite communication is isolated from the workflow layer. So SQLite does not have uh, a network connection like most SQL implementations. It relies entirely on file, the file system. There's a SQLite 3 database file in the work h directory as well as the journal when something is in the middle of a transaction and uh, a lock file that we have at the Python script level to ensure only one job is writing to the database at once. Now everything from the experiment layer on down uses that database indirectly via the util.datastore MPI module, I mean Python module. The workflow layer and intercycle layers never directly access that file. We try to prevent having anything key to the functioning of HWARF in the workflow or intercycle layers or even the scripting layer because it, it uh, keeps you from being able to make the system cross-platform and portable to other workflow management methods. So the workflow and inner cycle layer never use the database directly. So hopefully that answered Terry's question. Are there any other questions? All right, um, we will move on. Sam, I'm going to give you the, oh, nope, I missed it a little. Let's try. I, I sent a request to become the presenter. I don't know that I got the request, but I definitely gave you permission. We can see that screen now. Okay, I'm going to talk about the ProdUtil Python package. So before I go on to the description, uh, let me explain, explain what a package and a module is in Python. A Python package is a collection of modules, kind of like, a module is kind of like a Fortran module. It just is a bunch of constants and functions and subroutines and other Fortranish things. In Python, you can have the same sorts of things in a module. So something Fortran does not have is a way of grouping together multiple similar modules. And the way it, that's handled in Fortran is usually just to put the modules in some directory somewhere, and you add a dash i path to that directory in your Fortran compilation line when you need to use that set of modules. It's more or less the same way that Python handles it. A, a directory that contains modules is a package, and you have to make one special file double underscore in it double underscore dot py in order for Python to recognize it as a Python package. You can even have packages within packages. For example, we have a produtil package with an MPI impl package inside of it. Now, the produtil package was created for a specific purpose. The, Python, when we were writing this new HR Python system, we discovered there are many, many bugs in the Python core libraries, especially the old ones that are in the Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Red Hat is really not a distribution designed for scientific coding or large workflow automation. It's really just an enterprise server distribution. And it really reflects that in their choice of Python 2.6.6. The latest 2.6 release is 2.6.9, which has many bug fixes and which is what we really should upgrade to, except it's not an option in Red Hat. So in order to run this in operations, we had to create a library with 
a uh, package with many bug fixes in it. Workarounds for the bugs are in the Python core libraries. In addition, the Python core libraries lack logging, automatic logging functionality. For example, there's no way to automatically print, I'm making a sim link from here to here when you make a symbolic link. They also lack error checking. There are many things that can go wrong. For example, well, I guess there's too many examples for that. We'll see some later. The, in short, the Python, can everyone still hear me? Yes. We can hear you uh, at HRD. Okay, sorry, I was hearing some odd sounds from my phone. Maybe I had a second caller try to call me. All right, so the, uh, in short, the Python core libraries are not entirely reliable. They can be made reliable by putting a wrapper around them. In addition, they are not backward compatible. When you upgrade from Python 2.5 to 2.6 to 2.7, or God forbid, 3. something, they change considerably. So if we have a the compatibility layer between us and the Python core libraries, then it lets us counteract these backward incompatibility issues and many other issues. And the last issue is that scientists are not so good at security and reliable coding. And I was out, asked to censor the word that I used. That's why there's this frowny face there now. And so the produtil package gives us, or specifically NCO, and a way of putting a guard between our unreliable scripts and code and the workflow system and to some extent Linux kernel. For example, we could check name lists to make sure file names are not too long for the arrays that people use for their file names in the Fortran code, which as you know is always too short, 30, 40, 60 characters. So that's what this produtil package is for. Now I'm going to go over some of the produtil package. Of course, the entire purpose of the Python system is to run programs and deliver the results. So we actually have, I think, five slides here on how to run programs. So the first example, running echo, if you just do exe echo, what that'll do is create a runner object that knows how to find the executable echo and knows how to run it. It's not actually going to run it until you pass it into the run function. You can also send arguments. We have, uh, we use an array syntax for passing arguments. So the return value of exe echo accepts array syntaxes to add arguments and you can make it into echo hello world. If you run check run instead of run, then that will raise an exception if echo returns a non-zero status. Run star is like check run except it returns the standard out from the program after the program exits. And so there's several variants of EXE which all do exactly the same thing on most platforms unless you're on the Cray. The Cray platform works differently than everyone else. The way that works is that your main batch script runs on a batch node along with the batch scripts for a hundred or more other jobs. And when you run app run, which is the equivalent of MPI run or MPI exec, app run will launch your program on the Cray compute nodes. So there's two different ways to run programs on the Cray. You can run your program directly on the batch node, or you can run it on a compute node. Nearly always you want to run it on the compute node. There's a few exceptions, such as trying to connect to HPSS or other network. In that case, you have to run it on the batch node. So we have batch exe, which is to run the program on the batch node. Big exe or exe will run it on the compute node. Of course, you want to run MPI programs. And we have support for complicated uh, MPMD programs as well as simple ones simple SPMD. So when you do MPI 
parentheses wharf.exe, it's going to create an MPI ranks base that knows, or if you, oh, I forget the object name, it creates an object that knows how to find the wharf.exe and express it as an MPI rank. If you multiply it by a number, it'll make more than one of that MPI rank. You can also add several of these together to put together a complex MPMD system and it'll put them together in the order that you specify. So in this example there will be nine coupler processes, 90 ocean, 120 wave, and 600 wharf in that order. But this doesn't actually run a program or even produce an object that knows how to run a program. The MPI run function takes this complicated sequence of MPI what's it and returns a runner similar to what EXE produces. It creates a runner that knows how to start that MPI program using your at your uh, batch system's local method of starting an MPI program. So it'll use MPI, Exacon, JET, MPI, run, LSF on the older W classes, Akron on Cray, and so on. And there's a produtil.mpi impl package that contains one module for each method of running MPI programs, as well as one module for running OpenMP when MPI is not supported. When the, what, the return value from MPI run is a runner, and if you send it to check run, run stir, or run, then it'll actually run that program. The suggested method is to use check run or run stir so that an exception will be raised if your program returns non-zero status. So here are some other examples. In, there are some cases where you don't want to run a, a particular number of MPI ranks. You just want to use however many of the jobs it supplied. In fact, that's nearly always the case. So there's an all ranks equals true option to MPI run that will try to get as many MPI ranks as it can. We have an OpenMP function that sets up OpenMP. The same MPI impl sub package handles that. Since in general, Trying to run with OpenMP is different from platform to platform. In some cases, you have to use the same program that's used to launch an MPI job, like on the Cray. And there's a complicated example which will produce in a command that runs MPI run to start your fancy MPI program on 32 ranks and pipe the input into your serial program instructing it to use bubble sort. And it's going to take the output of that and return it as a string. So you can do complicated pipelines. If you look through our code, you'll see things with three or four or more programs piped into one another in some places. Now I'll talk a little bit about the internals. So the exe, batch exe, or whatever, return a runner object, which has internal information stored about what program you want to run. It can also handle complex pipelines, in which case there will be multiple runner objects connected to one another. And there's how to convert that command into the equivalent shell command in cases where that's possible. Our Python scripts can actually run programs that are not possible to run through a shell command. Then MPI and MPI serial return a tree of MPI rank space ob objects. There's actually several subclasses to handle SPMD, MPMD, MPI serial, and so on. The MPI run function takes a tree of MPI rank space objects and converts it to a runner that you can then run using check run, run, or run star. Alias is a critical function. So you may remember a few slides ago I showed you that you can use an array syntax to add arguments to an existing runner. When you do that, it modifies the runner. So let's suppose you have a runner that you created that runs uh, convert grib to convert stuff from grib 1 to 2. Well, every time you use the array syntax to add arguments, it'll just keep appending arguments to that uh, convert grib program. So the first time you use it, it'll work. The second time, it'll have all of the arguments from the previous run plus the two new arguments for your next set of files. 
and obviously that won't work. So we have a function called alias, which returns an immutable runner. And the immutable runner just has magic inside of it to create a new copy of itself when you ask to change it in any way. It serves the same purpose as an alias in a shell. If you have a common, uh, a common application you need to run, then you create an alias for it. Like I would make an alias for convert grib dash g12 dash p32 to convert from grib1 to 2 with complex encoding and second order differences. And then I could use the resulting immutable runner multiple times to add the arguments and rerun it. And I'm not going to end up with the runner being reused since the immutable runner creates a new one each time. So next we'll go on to data delivery, which is really the other half of the NSEP suite. We run programs and we deliver data. So there's several aspects to this. One is the product and task classes. A product class internally has knowledge of where its product resides, whether the product is available and it can store and re retrieve metadata. It has a list of callback functions also. The callback functions are just a list of functions that are to be called when the product's state changes from unavailable to available. This is used to, hand, to handle product delivery magic. For example, when the track is delivered, we have a, a, a special function that's called to copy that track file to the global track database in the COM area on NSEP. And there's also an email sent to the SDM when the AFOS file that is available. Whoever that is, could you please mute your phone? Please. Uh, there's also DBN alerts that are triggered. DBN alerts are part of the NSEPS data delivery system. When you run the DBN alert program in any op any part of the operational suite, it contacts the DBN database and tells it a product has become available. DBNet then sends the data to the FTP pod or to one of a million other places where NSAP delivers data. DBNet is not part of our system. It's external to the h and this is only relevant if you're in the SPA team. So we have a dedicated Python module called DBN alert, which knows how to send these alerts. And it's designed to work with the product callback functions. It, there's a class DBN, DBN alert, which, crea which creates a callable object. So it's an object that looks like a function of the Python. And you just tell it the arguments that need to be sent to the DBN alert program. And when the product is delivered, it will call that DBN alert at exactly the right time when the data becomes available. And the magic of this is that you don't have to know the exact point in the code where the product is delivered. It could be delivered from one of a million locations and it won't matter to you. You just have to know the product object that delivers it. So we have another module at the top level, hwarfalerts.py, and that inserts all of the DBN alerts plus a few other delivery options such as uh, emailing the SDM and delivering data to the global track database. All of that is handled from one central location, HORF alerts, in the USH directory. All right, now produtil.fileop contains many uh, common shell operations. The names are slightly different, but the functions are almost the same. So I don't know how useful it is to read through all of these, but you can see all of the common ones. There's a few notable ones. Make door dash p in Linux does not work reliably. If you have multiple threads trying to make the same directory tree at the same time, then 
the first one will work, but the second thread will fail partway through because the first one has already made one of the directory components. So when the second one tries to make the same component, it'll get an error saying that the directory already exists. The Python uh, core libraries have the same bug as the shell make dir p so our make dirs command actually has a workaround for that, unlike the Python core make dirs. Another note is don't use CE. It's there, but we have a dedicated produtil.cd packet module that I'll talk about in a minute that's superior. And of course, we have an equivalent to which. So we have an improved version of copy. I believe NCO has a shell program that serves the same purpose, though I don't remember the name. This is a safer version of copy that does not leave a, that does not produce a, a partially completed file as it's copying. Instead, it copies to a temporary file in the target directory and moves that file to the final destination. We call that function deliver file. It has a number of other capabilities, such as verifying the data that it copied, removing the temporary file if the copy failed. You can also preserve or not preserve various attributes like the group ID, permissions, and so on. The deliver file can convert the file while it's delivering. We use that extensively to convert from netcdf3 to compress netcdf4. You could also convert grib1 to 2 and so on. Frequently, in the NCEP suite, we have to run little old Fortran programs that just read from read or write to specific unit numbers without opening the files, which is a bad practice, by the way. But I'm sure it'll still be a bad practice in 30 years. So we have two functions to make that easier, fort link and fort copy. The fort link makes symbolic links, and fort copy makes copies of input files. Now, in principle, these could be changed for platforms that don't use forts.number functions, but so far, all of the platforms we've used, they look for files with fort.unit number. So that's how these functions work. The fort link will make symbolic link uh, fort.10 to in file, whereas the fort copy would copy in file one to fort.10. So next, I'll go into some file manipulation. There is a function called check file. You can give it a list of conditions to check for, and it'll check to see if that, those conditions are met. There's a wrapper around it called wait for files. You, produce, you give it the same information of check files, but you give it a list of files to wait for. I believe there's also a percentage you can wait until X number of them are ready, and it returns the number that were available. Produtil.listing is another useful tool. It's there. So if you look in a lot of the NCEP suite scripts, they're set up to do an ls minus l of the local directory after a failure so that you can see the state of the directory at the moment the job failed. That's important because the data directory might be scrubbed before you have a chance to look at the problem in detail. Now, there, a user complains that we were using ls minus l in our scripts despite our goal of not using anything external to our workflow. Of course, the ls minus l would fail on Gaia since there's no ls. And so this is just a re-implementation of ls minus l without the annoying colors. It does also internally store the results of the intermediate step of listing the directory. So after you use the listing object to list the directory, you can then query things like file names. Now, as I said, we have a better version of CD. Now, if you look at a script, let's suppose you CD to a temporary directory, do some stuff, and then exit. Well, what if the uh, intermediate stuff that happens before the exiting of the directory fails? You're not going to exit the directory. So we use the Python with block. 
the way the width block works is that at the top of the line of the width block, you create some object. It calls the object's enter function at the top of the block, and it calls the exit function at the bottom of the block, no matter what happens inside the block. So this allows us to create a width block in which you can do stuff inside a directory and be guaranteed that you've left the directory at the bottom of the block. There's two of these. One is designed for temporary directories, and the other one is designed for directories that are not supposed to be deleted. So in the top one, you can see the indented part of the width block is where you're inside the temporary directory. Now there's a whole bunch of options like in the in the named dir version where you're not using a temporary directory, you can actually tell it to delete the directory before CVing into it. We do that to GSI and WARF temporary directories, which have a predetermined location. We want to make sure we destroy any old files so that it doesn't confuse the next run of GSI or WARF. Could you please mute your phones? I can't hear myself. Uh, Produtil.lock file handles file locking. It works similarly to the name tour and temp tour in the CV module. We have some places on our scripts where we have to raise the stack limit. So for that purpose, we added the R usage module, which can query or set resource limits and usage. So this lets us monitor the stack and memory and such usage from various programs we run, as well as set the limits when needed to a larger limit. So you'll see that set our limit stack equals 6E9 in a few places in our workflow where we have to process spectral files. Produtil.log is a wrapper around the Python logging module. And it sets up a uh, it sets up the standard NSEP JLog file output syntax when writing to the NSEP wide JLog file. That log that file contains logging from the entire NSEP suite. We'll talk more about these issues in detail in a later logging presentation. There's there's also some functionality in there to handle multi-threaded jobs where you split your script into multiple threads of scripting. It'll add some extra information telling which scripts generated the log message. Produtil.cluster lets you query some basic information about your local cluster. If it's able to recognize your cluster, it'll tell you things like the name and whether you're on the NSEP production machine and uh, support for access control lists and so on. Produtil.batch system just gives you the job name and ID. That's there mainly to support the JLog file output syntax. The RST prod module handles no restricted data. It has an underlying support module called produtil.acl, which is present to handle access control lists on Zeus. You also need it on Jet uh, LFS 2 and 3. So this, no, this module knows the correct way to set RST pod access controls on the various clusters. And on the clusters where you're not allowed to have restricted data, it knows to raise an exception telling you not to tag the files as RST pod. The produtil.sig safety module works around many, many known bugs in parallel file systems where things will go wrong if you don't clean up properly when your job exits. So the SIG safety module adds some handlers that will catch the signal it sends to the job to tell it to exit. It will try to kill any programs that are running and will clean up any locks. And we had to add this for a number of reasons. One is that we found there's some, some situations you can get into where your job will not exit when receiving SIG term or SIG int. So the SIG safety has some workarounds to make it more likely the job will exit. And it's also connected to the produtil.locking module to ensure that it refuses to lock any files and unlocks everything it has locked immediately upon a signal received. 
quadutil.retry is just a, the underlying implementation of the locking. When you try to grab a lock, frequently the lock will already be grabbed. If you're in a massively parallel workflow, it'll be grabbed by some other thread already. And so this has an exponential back-off algorithm to retry the lock. You can use it for other operations as well. Produtil.workpool has a work pool class that makes it easy to implement simple threading. You provide a, you give it the number of threads to make and you provide a list of functions to call. It'll ensure the function is only called once by one thread and it'll automatically kill threads upon the job being uh, killed by the batch system. It's connected to the logging capabilities correctly. This is more really just a convenience to allow threading scripts to be easier. There's a number of other modules such as the data store, which will have a dedicated presentation later today. At parse is just a simple text pre-parser. And the podutil.run has a whole bunch of underlying implementation modules. MPI impl is an entire sub package with one module for each MPI implementation. Prog and MPI prog handle serial and MPI programs respectively. Prog contains the runner and immutable runner classes, whereas MPI prog contains the entire MPI ranks base tree. The produtil.pipeline knows how to run programs. It re-implements the Python subprocess module, which contains some critical bugs that make it unusable for multi for three or more stage pipelines on Python 2.6.6. We hear claims that that was fixed in a later version of 2.6, but unfortunately, that's the only version we have on most of the NOAA machines. And that's my last slide. Are there any questions? Is anyone still awake? We're still, still awake. Here, Sam. Are any flakes coming down? Uh, I'm no. Here. Sam, I got a quick question. It, is there? Um, I know you you had the ls in the Produtil file up, but what about like ls minus one? Is that? Oh, uh, there's a few places where we have to list the contents of a directory. There's two ways of doing it, depending on what you're trying to do. If you're trying to do ls minus one of, I don't know, start a grib, then the Python core blob module is good at handling that. Okay. The other way is to use open dir and read dir, which lists the entire contents of dir directory as quickly as possible. Okay, so so those are okay to use. Um, those don't have errors. In they, they should be avoided because they're heavy on the MPI on the. Uh, sorry, there's a really bad echo. It's hard to talk. Uh, if you list a directory, it's hard on the metadata servers, especially if you're listing a directory frequently. We go to great trouble in the H4 system to avoid listing directories. We have probably about a thousand lines of Python scripts that do uh, time manipulation in order to predict the exact output file name of every WARF output file, no matter what crazy time steps and start and end times you choose, just so that we never have to list the WARF run directory. But there are a few places in the scripts where you cannot predict the output file name. And so we do have listing. And I have not seen any bugs in the open dir, read dir, or in the glob. So they do seem safe to use. So do we have any more questions? Not, I guess I'll go to the see. Break. Play Christina is next with logs. So, so uh, I feel like we could probably take just a ten minute break. Um, 
and come back at 11 as scheduled and uh, get through this next session. Is that okay with everybody? Sounds good. That works for us. All right. Um, also, I just wanted to mention okay. to those of you, okay, about uh, the logs, and then Sam is going to take over for quite a while and do uh, troubleshooting and uh, configuring talks. Um, so I am going to offer to be presenter. Can you guys see my screen? Okay. All right. Um, and then moving through slides, you can see that. Okay. So I'll get started with this uh, logs overview. Um, I am moving on to slide two just to, to make sure um, you can see that. Uh, so the types of logs that I wanted to talk about in this talk uh, just include the ones that come out of the Python system. Uh, I don't want to really get into the Rakoto logs here um, just because we will be talking about those a little bit later in the Rakoto talk, but I will cover here the JLog file, the Python standard error and standard output files that come from each of the uh, scripts that runs, and then you also have per job log files that come from um, running the executables. So uh, I want to cover a little bit of information about those uh, those types of logs. So um, it's it's a good idea to wrap your head around uh, some of the, the common file locations and the environment variables we use. Um, I realize that I use these a lot, but never or don't often tell everybody uh, or think that maybe everybody doesn't understand where these are. So um, I just want to clarify here that if I say home HWRF, I just mean that's where the HWRF is installed on your uh, computer. Work HWRF is uh, that area where all of the work is done. So under PyTemp, um, the date, uh, storm, all of that stuff. The intercom is a subdirectory of work HWRF, and um, this is where everything lives, where we're uh, shuffling files back and forth between uh, uh, different tasks. The com HWRF is the ultimate data delivery area where everything is moved um, once it's done and uh, can communicate between cycles. Um, then there are a couple other common variables. Uh, the log uh, variable is just uh, log files that aren't specific to a storm or cycle. The job is the name of the job. Job ID is the job ID assigned by the batch system, so probably some um, long number string. Uh, time you see it, YMD combination or HH, that's going to be a date string of some sort with year, month, day, hour. And then STID is um, typically a three character storm ID. Um, sometimes it's uppercase, sometimes it's lowercase, but usually that's specified. Um, usually when it's an environment variable, it's going to be uppercase though. So this is like uh, 12L or 31W for the uh, 12th storm in the Atlantic or 31st storm in the Westpac. So um, NCO has a couple of other variables, and uh, these are going to be. Uh, ENVIR, and uh, that's going to be uh, the prod, para, or test for the production parallel or test version of HWRF. So this holds uh, what version of HWRF they're running, and storm number is going to be a number from 1 to 7 um, for the storm priority. So just keeping the talking about logs is pretty important because I just throw them in a lot here. So if you're NCO, you're going to see uh, a typical setup such that work HWRF is in, in the location I've listed here uh, with the environment variables kind of substituted in there. Um, and you can read through these, but um, so the JLog file doesn't so much exist um, that I know of if you're NCO, but if you're a typical repository user running on one of 
NOAA's research computers, you're going to typically see something closer to um, the box at the bottom, the blue box, where um, we're setting a CD scrub directory, and that's just your top-level directory where you want all of this, this um, output to go. And um, COMHWRF is going to be, again, under a similar area with your log going to, uh, to that area as well. So um, this information is set in your configuration. You can change it if you like, um, but be careful that you're changing it in a consistent way or you're going to uh, have a problem finding all of your output. Um, and the system's going to have a problem finding, uh, finding some things too. So you have to make sure that you're, you're changing it appropriately. Uh, the first log I want to talk about is the J log. Uh, for most people, it's located in the PyTemp area. Um, this is, as I mentioned, uh, not sure what the equivalent for NCO is, but um, they're going to set that with the, the J log file um, environment variable, but uh, it's set for everybody big um, files. So this log is just going to contain a record of the completion of the HWARF jobs and any other log messages for all the jobs run by the, the experiment uh, for any storm and cycle in that experiment. This log file only contains the highest level messages and I'll show you later what I mean by that. And uh, to write to the JLog file all you have to do is at uh, making sure that your produtil object is defined um, for the logger uh, for the jlogger. You can write with uh, produtil.log.jlogger, and the info or critical just depends on um, uh, what level of information you want to pass to the log file. So here's an example of um, the information that you can find in the jlog file. And um, here you can see that uh, we get all kinds of information about the WS, WPS um, net grid completed, the geogrid completed, those types of things. We got an error in here. Uh, this is a pretty innocuous error that we get um, just about every time we run a launcher. Um, so just uh, basic information is included here with errors as well. The standard error and standard out data stream are uh, files that are located in the work HWARF directory. They contain all of the logging uh, messages from the Python scripts from many different levels of logging from info to critical. Um, I thought I updated this file as of uh, very recently. The standard out and standard error were uh, logged separately. So if you have an older version of HWRF still on your machine, you're going to get a, uh, a set of these output files um, that are .out and .error. If you run a newer version um, circa, you know, last week, you'll get a whole set of these that are pretty similar, but they're joined in one stream and named .log. So uh, there's at least one for each task. Some of the tasks that have multiple processor jobs have multiple sets of logs. And those include things like the posts, the products, and the tracker. So um, if, oops, sorry. Uh, if we want to write to the standard out of, uh, uh, of any of the, the components, we can do that pretty easily by adding log messages from the USH scripts with just a few simple commands. So the commands that are related to writing to the log include um, uh, setting up logger, referencing it um, with this first line here. Uh, we can say, uh, we can log an info message at the level info and just say, this is the value of some variable here and print out the variable value. Um, if we want to be a little bit more forward about, you know, this variable is pretty big for this field, like, you could print it out and say, this is a warning. Um, if it's 
if it's something that goes pretty wrong and you want to make sure that you see it um, in, in many of the logs, you can say this is an error and critical will uh, kill your, um, you'll probably want to kill everything and say this is really bad. So um, you have several different levels of, uh, of messages that you can send to these standard out and standard error files. Um, and here is an example of what you would get from from setting these if you did it in the GFS init um, uh, files. So, moving on, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the Python log structure. So, uh, in these lines that I gave you the example of in the previous slide, I just wanted to point out there is a date and time of the log message. So, when you ran uh, this particular command, and when it executed, this is this is the result. Here, uh, it's going to tell you the log stream. So this tells you which task you're in when you're running, and it gives you uh, the file and line number that generated the message. So you can go to that place in the script and um, and see what's going on. It tells you what log level you were logging at, and it prints the message that you were logging here. So um, this is pretty general for any message that you're sending out, and this is how you would go about reading the, the log files. Uh, I wanted to mention the logging levels here. So um, if you're developing new code, you can use a debug level, and that's really um, not meant to be used in the, the system once it's in its final state, but by the developer as you're debugging. Um, an info level means that it's just regular status information like I talked about earlier. It goes to the standard out, um, but not the standard error in JLog files if those are split. Since they're joined, you would get it in your log file, definitely. Um, the warning level is uh, info that is useful for debugging for failed jobs, uh, but not necessarily critical to the workflow. So um, it goes to your log or standard error and standard out streams. Um, it goes, it does not go to the JLog file. The only two that go to the JLog file are the error and critical, and those um, errors typically are meant to uh, outline any errors that degrade the forecast or disable other components. Um, and that's when you're using fallbacks. Uh, you want to know about that fallback being used, but it's not critical. So uh, critical being defined as a failure that requires some sort of human intervention. Um, so uh, again, I want to mention, just to point out, that standard error and standard out are now joined by default in in the, in the trunk, but older versions you would still have um, that you might have lying around on disk or that you had checked out a while back and are still running would still have the standard out and standard error um, files coming out of them. All right, so uh, when you do see a failure in HWRF components, uh, you'll get an exception stack in your standard out and standard error, and this is just a a collection of lines telling you a little bit more information about how uh, the, the script failed. So here we're seeing an example for GSI failing. Um, it tells us a lot of information about that, including uh, where it failed and what lines of what script. So it, it kind of traces it all the way through the scripts and down to the USH calls that it was making just before it failed. So um, and then it, it ends with a, um, a a final sorry um, it ends with a final just one second I have housekeeping here please don't disturb. the fun of uh, giving talks from the hotel. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so, all right, so the log 
from each of the components uh, come from running each of those uh, executables. And anytime you're running WPS, you're going to get logs from uh, Metgrid, GeoGrid, Ungrid, and those are in the working directories of those um, those particular uh, those particular components. So GSI has a standard out. Uh, then it writes to the coupler, has coupled that out, and um, WERF has all of the RSL files. And there's a uh, one RSL out and error for each rank of uh, the WERF system, as well as one uh, main uh, RSL out file that contains extensive logging for the for the executable. So um, I'll go in a little bit more depth. The forecast logs uh, give us a lot of information. There are three coupled components for the atmosphere, ocean, and coupler. The coupler and the ocean share one uh, log, and that is the coupled or CPL.out in the work HWRF directory. It's under run HWRF, I believe. This, um, this extra file exists because it's so big. Um, and then WERF, as I mentioned, has all of its out and error files for each rank in the run WERF directory, uh, where the master process does extensive logging in the rsl.out file 0000. Um, while you could have a failure on any rank, uh, that, w uh, that information would show up in this this master, um, and you would also see the information in the individual rank file. Uh, the post-processing and re logs here um, have other information that is useful. The post-processing is split into post and products jobs. The post runs the UPP to convert the WARF out files to uh, native eGrid GRIB files, and then the products generates Sorry, regrids the UPP output to standard grids. So, um, oh, it also copies the grid files and native work output files to the COM and runs the tracker. So the post standard out is pretty big, and um, it's not there as long as uh, post exceeded so that we don't keep it around on disk. Uh, but if there is a failure in post, you can view the log um, before it's deleted, and it, it lives in uh, work HWARF under post with some uh, random uh, randomly generated uh, um, tag there, and then it's vpost.log. So check that log for any post failures. Uh, the products logs include logs from grippers, copiers, trackers, and um, each of them uh, is is generated from from uh, within the scripts that run them. So uh, the gribbers just run the convert grib, wgrib, and copy gb programs. Uh, so that information will live in the uh, in the uniquely named logs uh, that have the job ID in them, and then uh, gribber rank one to seven. Was somebody asking a question? Okay, sorry. Um, then we have copiers, uh, and those again are going to have the job ID in in the copier log. Uh, you'll look in here if uh, you start having uh, problems with uh, the files getting moved around. Uh, the model output here is copied, and then um, once all of those have been copied, they start regribbing if that's necessary. So uh, lastly, we have the tracker logs, and these just run the GFDL vortex tracker on the outputs from the gribbers once they're available, and um, the main tracker runs by default, um, and then there are additional trackers that run on the domains one and two output. So um, you'll get uh, three different logs if you're running all of those trackers. There are also init and boundary logs, and 
So they also run with some extensive logging, more so than what is in the, the output from the standard error, standard out um, streams. Each init job has its own uh, stream, but the logs that are there uh, could be in any, uh, any of several places. So um, what I mean by that is that we're doing two types of initialization, GFS init and FGAT init. Um, within GFS init, there are um, uh, two different locations where you get output. One is in the work uh, HWRF directory under GFS init, and that's uh, like it's described the work area for GFS init. And then the files that are needed for the next um, downstream component are moved then to intercom. The same is true for three different FGAT. Uh, areas where we do FGAT initialization for three hours before and three uh, the time of analysis and three hours after. So you'll get three different FGAT directories all with the same directory structure underneath. Um, and then the same thing is in intercom where uh, again we're placing files for downstream use. Um, under each of the GFS init and FGAT uh, directories, you'll have uh, working directories for um, many of the other uh, components. So this includes uh, the WORF analysis, GHOST, and um, many others. So all of the initialization procedures for each of those um, is under these directories. And the logs for those live there too. So we're talking about initialization. Um, we do GeoGrid, UnGrid, MetGrid, and those all have their uh, WPS logs, and they're going to live um, in in those locations under GFS init and FGAT init. Uh, Prep Hybrid is done um, as well, so there are uh, also logs in there for those. Um, each of these is uh, slightly different, and uh, I assume described in detail in the documentation for each of the individual components, but um, I just want you to know where you might find them here. So um, again, if you're running WORF and REAL, then you'll, um, in the initialization procedure, uh, you'll have very similar logs to the forecast logs uh, under the REAL init and REAL forecast, WORF analysis, and GHOST. All of these are uh, set up for short forecast. So it's uh, the same WARF uh, logging situations as we would have seen in the actual WARF long forecast. Uh, we also have some post-processing logs that are in the initialization procedure and that's because uh, we do some post-processing for generating the parent vortex location. So we have post, grid task, and tracker also in the, the initialization directories. And those, um, those associated logs live there as well. So that was a lot of, here's, here are a lot of uh, locations for different kinds of logs. Uh, and all of this information is available on the the Doxygen website. But um, are there any questions about where those logs exist and where you can find information for failures and that sort of thing uh, with uh, running HWARF components. Is everybody still there? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, was that a question? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Um, I will then give the uh, reins over to Sam to continue with this uh, portion of the, the talks. He's going to be talking about troubleshooting. So now that we know where those uh, files live, then we can uh, start talking about how to use them a little bit better when we do have something that goes wrong. So, Sam, uh, did you get the did you get the transfer? Yes, I see it. Excellent. Okay, uh, before I talk about 
troubleshooting, let me make one note. Uh, in the presentation Christina just gave, she said we send some things to standard out and some things to standard error, which is true. However, in the EC flow workflow and in the trunk version of the Rakoto workflow, we actually join the standard out and standard error in the batch job level, which makes it much easier to find errors. So it's really only relevant when you're running the wrappers or running your EX script directly. Of course, all of the messages will still be there whether you split standard out and standard error or not. All right, so I'll tell you about troubleshooting the H4. So we'll go through how to figure out why the workflow stopped and then I'll talk about various workarounds for known issues, how to manually execute things, and how to determine certain common types of failure. So in EC flow, it's really easy to tell how or tell where your workflow is stopped. You just bring up the EC flow window, everything is color coded based on the status, and you can see that some of the jobs have not been submitted yet and some of them have failed. In Rokoto, it's a bit more work. You have to run Rokoto stat, which tells you the status of your jobs. It's split up into jobs for each cycle, and then uh, each job tells you the status of that job. Now, typically, you will see hyphen running or queued in a properly functioning system. Could you please mute whoever that is? Could you please mute? So most of the jobs will have a hyphen in their state, which means the dependency is not yet met, or a throttle is reached, like the maximum number of active jobs, or the job is just not part of that workflow. So just if you're running with GSI disabled, you'll never see anything but hyphen for the GSI job. Submitting means the job was submitted and you haven't run Rakoto yet, again yet. So we get a lot of con confused questions from new users asking why their jobs are all in submitting status it's because you need to run the run hwarf.py again every few minutes to check the status. Queued means that the job was submitted and Rakoto saw it in the queued state. So you just have to wait for it to get through the workflow. Of course, if the job was submitted with an impossible request, like asking for 64 cores per node, then it'll probably stay in the queue forever in most machines. Not all of the NOAA machines know how to detect an impossible request at the batch submission step. If it says running, then it means Rokoto Run saw the job running at the last check. If it's actually not running, then that can mean that you're not running Rakoto Run, or it can mean that Rakoto Run... Uh, could people please mute? I'm having trouble thinking. It's the same individual. I, I'm trying to figure out who it is from the GoToMeeting, but I, I can't. So if you're out there and you're speaking on the phone continually, it's probably you, so please mute it. Unless right. you're Sam, then it's okay to talk. Yes, I will talk. So if you're, if Rakoto says that your job is running and your job is not running, then either you just need to wait until the next time your cron job runs Rakoto run, or something's wrong and you're not actually running Rakoto run. If it says dead, then that means the job has failed too many times and you've reached your preset failure limit. If it says unavailable, then that means the batch system is down. Unknown usually also means the batch system is down. Both of those can be temporary batch system failures. For example, on WCOS phase one and two, sometimes the batch system will just get really slow and take a few minutes to respond to more complicated B jobs and B hist requests. And so Rakoto will say unknown or unavailable for a while. Please mute your phone. Whoever is that is that's talking to us in Chinese, please mute your phone. Rokoto check 
is able to tell you why a job has not been submitted. There's a number of things that can be wrong. Usually it means dependencies are not met. Until a dependency is met, Rokoto won't submit a job. The job will also not be submitted if the throttles are reached. For example, in Rokoto you can place a maximum for the number of cycles or the number of running jobs. And once those are reached, Rokoto will not submit more jobs of that type or start more cycles. If a cycle has not been started, then none of the jobs for that cycle will be started. And the first cycle is the launcher job. And of course, jobs are not submitted if you forget to run Rokoto run. So as we said several times, there is an allow fallbacks option which turns on automatic fallbacks. There's many places in the scripts where we detect failures and have automatic ways to recover from them. And that is disabled by default in the R&D mode because we want to actually detect these failures and correct them or add better fallbacks. In operations, we have all allow fallbacks turned on by default. No, you you can change the configuration manually. Sorry, I skipped ahead. Okay, you can change the configuration manually for each storm and cycle. Each cycle of each storm has its own storm number dot conf for numbers from one to eight. Actually, one to seven in this year's H four eight in next year's, and that is a configuration file storm whatever dot conf generated by the first job in the workflow, the launcher job. There is a number of other files critical to the workflow that which I'll tell you about in these next two slides. But the critical one is the conf file. You can totally change the configuration for one particular cycle of one particular storm if need be in order to recover from the failure. The GSI status is what tells GSI whether it should run or not. That's, that was created initially. Hold on a second. My phone is beeping randomly. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, the GSI status file was created for the purposes of the East Pacific, where we turn on GSI only when the PDR failed operator data is available. But it can also be used to artificially turn off GSI in certain domains if there's failures by editing the file. The ocean status file is what the ocean model uses to tell the rest of the workflow whether it should run coupled or not. That was originally created for historical reasons when we used to have two Atlantic domains in the palm the uh, actually no well maybe uh, someone on the phone knows the details but there were certain situations where Palm had to disable ocean coupling briefly when you're crossing over the two domains the same file is still present in the current workflow and can be used to override ocean coupling before we even get to the forecast step run ENSDA is used to turn on and off the uh, the six-hour forecast ensemble jobs that happen between the cycles to drive data assimilation for the TDR data. You can run GSI without the ensemble DA. You can do this by setting run ensemble DA equals no and then just rerun the GSI. The workflow can continue without the ensemble DA and it should automatically recover from the failure of the ensemble DA if allow fallbacks is set to yes. You can also run without GSI. So we actually, even if you turn on GSI, we run an extra job that is almost never needed, which runs the vortex relocation and initialization on the GFS analysis. 
the reason that job is run is so that if the data assimilation system fails, we can fall back to using the no data assimilation setup. And people all called me crazy for adding that in until the GFS ENKF itself failed. There were some invalid files fed into the HWARF data assimilation. And so the result of our data assimilation was unable to be was unable to be used by the forecast and we fell back to the non GSI forecast automatically. Or sorry, not automatically. It couldn't be this forecast cannot this failure cannot be handled automatically because we don't know that there's a problem until usually a couple hours into the forecast and requires manual analysis of the results in order to know that the cause was a uh, extremely strong typhoon causing numerical instability in the low-res GFS ENKF. So we have the capability of turning off the GSI by editing that storm whatever .com file. Now, if you're using EC flow, it's easy to rerun the forecast correctly. You just tell EC flow to resubmit the forecast job and recursively go through, and it'll do that in a single button click. In Rokoto, or, use, or if you're running this EX scripts manually, it's a little more complicated. With Rokoto, you use Rokoto Rewind, and we'll tell you about that later. But here's the process you need to go through to rerun the forecast. You must always rerun the unpost and post processing as well. Otherwise, the post processing will get confused when it sees new data showing up. So the first step is to resubmit the forecast, wait for it to run, then you resubmit the unpost, which clears out the database entries for all of the forecast outputs and post-processing temporary and output files. Then you run the post in products once the unpost is done. And you can automate this with either ECflow or Rokoto. Sometimes you want to rerun just the post-processing, and that's done. At there's two different situations. One is because the post-processing simply didn't have enough time to finish, in which case you want to reuse, you want to use the post-processing restart capability. If you simply resubmit the post and products job, they'll continue where they left off. The only part of the products job that has to start over from the beginning is the tracker. The tracker only takes around a half hour to run. So the other situation is if there's some corrupted data, such as if you hit your quota, and in that case you rerun unpost, which will clear out the intermediate files and database and prepare for a clean new run of the post processing. Now, one key utility when you're adding new components to H4 for doing other complex debugging is to be able to manually execute the H4 system. There's three levels at which you can do this, and we'll talk about all three of them to some extent in the upcoming slides. The reason that it is possible is that the HORF is designed as a layered system. So the Rokoto or EC flow layers on top can be taken off, and you can even take off the scripting layer and directly run the Python object functions yourself. So the highest level at which you can manually run is the wrappers. Most of the jobs in the H4 workflow have a wrapper script in, a, in the wrappers directory. All they do is load some modules and set the bare minimum variables and then pass control over to the script, script slash EX, whatever. You do have to manually edit these for your batch system, and there's extensive documentation on the DTC website, so I won't talk about these in detail. Christina will get them get to them a little more later. You can also directly run EX scripts. This is invaluable when debugging because you don't want to have to submit batch jobs 50 times in order to catch 50 syntax errors in a new Python module you just wrote. So instead, you get a debug job, a interactive debug job on your cluster, and directly run the EX script manually each time. So 
there's generally three different types of EX scripts. The launcher is a type of its own. You have to set some extra variables, but this one you can run on a front end node. All it does is make a few files and directories. Most other jobs can be run more easily. There's a file storm. Sam, did we lose you? Uh oh. Let me see if he's in the uh the Uh, can you, Christina, do you have his phone number? Can you give him a call? Because it looks like he thinks he's still presenting. Yeah, let's see. Let me do that. I'm going to mute myself. Sam just sent a chat. He said he's, uh, He's trying to reconnect right now. Okay, thanks. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yep, you're Hello? back. Hello? Hi, Sam. You're back. You're back. Yeah, I, this is the second time my phone is randomly disconnected. Can you still see my screen? It looks like you can see my screen. So, does anyone know the last slide at which you could hear me talk? Is it the current one? No, it was back a little bit. Uh, how far back do I need to go? No, definitely ahead of this, past this. I think I think right about here is probably a good place to pick back up. I think I think this is where okay. you're somewhere around here. So run, manually running the EX scripts is invaluable, and well, it's, and the uh, EX H four launch is the first one in the workflow. It's the more, most complicated to run. Here's the syntax on the screen. You can run this on a front end node. It's a very lightweight script that just creates some directories and files. Most, could you please mute your phones? The later jobs have a uh, hold virus file that you can source. This file is left over from the old KSH system and it was retained just so that you could directly run the EX scripts. There's a few variables you have to set. One is total tasks, which tells the produtil MPI impl package how many MPI ranks are available to it. There's unfortunately no general cross-platform way to get that information, so we do have to pass it in through an environment variable. And you also have to tell Python where to find the Python modules. Then you run the EX script. Some of them require some additional arguments or environment variables, like the init job needs to know whether it's using GDAS or GFS, and if it's FGAT, it has to know which FGAT hour. There's documentation on this on the website, and you can also just mimic either the wrappers or the Rakoto or ECflow or JDOBs, which all know how to run the EX scripts. Now, the lowest level which you can run is through an interactive Python, interactive Python session in an interactive batch job. The process is similar. You source the hold bars in bash or KSH and set the Python path and number of MPI ranks. But then after that, your interactive Python, Python session will look a lot like the main function of one of the EX scripts. You have to load two modules. No matter what you're doing, you need these two. HWARF EXPT defines the object structure of the whole end-to-end -end system, and produtil.setup initializes produtil. You need to initialize produtil before doing anything else. And that's this produtil.setup.setup line. The second step is to initialize the HWARF EXPT. After that, all of the 
interesting bits of the H4 PT are available to you. Uh, there's one exception, the ENSDA will not be initialized unless you send an extra argument to init module. Now this method allows fine, con fine grain control over debugging and you can choose exactly what you want to run. So you don't have to run everything that one of the EX scripts runs. You can just run, for example, one output time of the non-satellite post instead of the entire post processing. Next thing we're going to talk about how to find out why various things have failed. This is not comprehensive, but I'll try to cover all of the common failures. So first off, the step for debugging things. You should always look at the main JLog file first. Frequently, you're going to find the reason for things failing in the JLog file. And if that's not enough, you check the jobs standard out and standard error logging. The error will usually be near the end, but it's not at the end. You may recall the produtil.listing module that I talked about earlier. We mimic the old KSH-based operational scripts by doing an ls minus l of the current directory at the end of the script if there's a failure. So if it's a big directory, like when GSI is running, there may be a thousand line listing after the actual error message. You need to look for the last one or two stack tracebacks. Just search for the word traceback. Those will tell you the line at which the problem happened. It's not always going to be the actual line that caused the problem. For example, if the, if the uh, WPS fails but produces output that looks valid and isn't valid, then there may be another failure later on. So let's get into WARF in a bit more detail. If you see it, could you please mute your phones? Crashes. I don't care. Mute your phone. Please mute your phone. Hey, Sam, do you want me to say Chinese and tell those people to mute? It's possible that the person who's talking is not on GoToMeeting. I keep say, seeing it say talking colon Sam Trahan comma phone caller. So I think someone's called into our line and ignoring the request to mute their phone. It sounds like they're talking in Chinese and they're female. So if anyone recognizes their voice, please let us know who it is so that we can get them to stop talking. So crashes earlier in the wharf are usually due to initialization problems. The common causes are ocean, the GSI, the vortex relocation, and generally you can find the root cause by looking at the input files. If the crash is after about six hours, then it's probably due to model issues or possibly due to issues in the Wharf BDY, the boundary uh, conditions. So there's a really confusing error message you will see if you're experimenting with huge domains or adding fast 40 arrays to the uh, Wharf output files. You will see quilt bad tag in the last few MPI ranks in the RSL error files, or maybe the out files too. That message comes from a 32-bit wraparound error in the WARF IO server implementation. It uses a 32-bit signed integer to calculate how many bytes you're sending from the compute grid to the IO server. So if you have a file that is X bytes in size, then you have to have at least X divided by 2 gigabytes IO servers in each IO server group to handle the file so that none of them have two gigabytes or more of data sent to them at once. So that really bizarre quilt bad tag means you need more IO servers per group. If you see nest moves during coupling time step, then that means you changed either the physics time step or the fundamental dynamical time step without updating the uh, Oh, or the 
tracker time step without updating it for the 540 second coupling time step. The, out, the domain to motion has to happen on that coupling time step. Also, in general, with any of these jobs, if you see it exit for no apparent reason, then that's probably a memory or disk quota issue, so especially memory. There's something called the Linux out of memory killer. When the machine runs out of available physical memory, it'll start killing processes partially at random. It favors processes that use a lot of memory, so generally your compute jobs will be the ones to be killed. Okay, now GSI, the main GSI job is in GSI underscore D0 and then one, two, or three for the three domains slash STD out. The standard error still goes to the main job log file, but GSI sends most of its logging to standard out and it's in that file. Usually when GSI fails, it's because there is missing data or some sort of corrupted buffer file or corrupted warf out. So you should check to make sure all of the files are present, have a non-zero size. GSI also has, requires huge amounts of memory due to how it processes the spectral input files. So if you see an empty STV out file or a sudden unexpected exit, that usually means that you're trying to run too many ranks per node of the GSI. You need to distribute it across more compute nodes with fewer ranks on each node. Prep hybrid and ungrib failures are nearly always because the input files are corrupted. Prep hybrid will give you all sorts of bizarre error messages and complain about invalid pressure data and stuff. That's because the SPLib will try really hard to process any junk you give it and provide us a uh, resulting 3D atmosphere of its complete nonsense. So check the input data if prep hybrid or ungrib fail. With the specific case of prop hybrid, if you try to go to a lower resolution version of GFS than the current one, you have to change the prop hybrid to use a smaller global grid for doing its uh, spectral to global grid transformation. Otherwise, you'll get severe Gaussing issues. This is especially true if you use CFS, which is much lower resolution. Geogrid issues are nearly always because of quota unless you're experimenting with large domains or high resolution domains. GeoGrid writes three files, one for each nesting level. Those files are, are large enough in geographically for the entire parent domain. So if you have, say, a four levels of nesting, 931 with a three and, uh, with a 0.3, sorry, a one third kilometer, fourth domain, then it's going to try to make a 75 by 75 degree grid with one third of the kilometer resolution for that entire grid, and it'll try to write it out to a file. That'll go well beyond the NetCDF3 and PNetCDF file format limitations. So you need to switch to either NetCDF4 with full HDF5 support or binary in order to support those massive domains. So the tracker has very good logging, and if you have a genuine failure of the tracker, the tracker itself, then it'll tell you why. Usually it's due to having some freakishly bizarre storms. So generally the tracker itself does not fail. Usually it, it just aborts waiting for the regridders to regrid data. Usually when the regridders fail, it's not actually a failure of the regridder, they're waiting for the post, and generally when the post fails, it's waiting for your failed forecast job. However, any of these can fail due to disk quota issues or hitting the wall clock limit. For any other failures with the regridder, make sure you read the regridder logs and look for traceback. It'll give you a Python traceback every time something fails. Each of the seven or so regridder threads will try each regridding operation three times before giving up. So if it's a failure that happens only 10% of the time, it's not going to matter because the operation will be retried 20 times before giving up. Uh, 
Right, and if you hit your disk quota or get any IO errors, make sure you rerun the unpost, post, and products because the uh, the files are probably invalid. The database may even be invalid if you have IO errors. Oh, looks like that's my last slide. So are there any questions? Is anyone there? We're here, Sam. Okay. Well, if there's no questions, I guess we go to the next presentation. So what is that? Six, seven. Oh. Apparently, I'm doing the next one. Apparently, I'm doing the next one. Yes. Okay. This is the exact same configuration presentation we did last time. However, we've made the time slot for this long enough so that we can go back to the website, the configuration website afterwards and explain some of the alternative configurations and how to select them. So as I said before, we are now using Unix conf files for configuring most of the H4 system. And we're taking advantage of some capabilities inside the Python core libraries for manipulating comp files, as well as some capabilities we've added for automatically generating Fortran name lists from comp files and manipulating the data in other ways. So this is to solve a problem we had of the old h horse, which had many copies of the same configuration file. Each one is independently maintained, so if you had to do something like changing a grid size, you had to do that in a dozen places. Resolution is especially complicated to change. But now you can change those by just modifying one file. And you don't even have to modify the file. Instead, you can provide extra arguments to the runhorf.py or in the jhorf launch to change the configuration without even editing a single farm file. So here's the flow of information. So on the left, you can see the contents of the PARM directory. I have five comp files listed there. They're read in order. The first one, hwork-input.conf, contains input source listings and tells what input sources are valid from each cluster, as well as how to access that. For example, if you are on JET, you can access the JET data sources on disk, whereas if you're on FIA, you can use SCP to access the JET data sources if you have an account. The hwarf.conf is the main configuration file. It has name list settings for all of WARF and for GSI. It contains some of the PON configurations. Just about anything you would want to configure is in the hwarf.conf. hwarf holdvars is used to generate the holdvars.txt file. The hwarfbasic.conf has some high-level configuration options that are not in the hwarf.conf. For example, turning on and off GSI altogether, or selecting between POM and HICOM as your OCEAN model. Just those high-level high level configuration are in that file. The system.conf has system-specific configuration, and it's also how we switch between the NCO and EMC configurations on the WCLOS cluster. You can also specify special override options. Sorry, accidentally went to the wrong slide. You can override options before you run the launch job. And that's uh, done at the jhorf launch if you're using ETflow. It's done at the runhorf.py if you're using Rokoto. And if you're running the scripts directly, you do it when calling the exhorf launch. And the wrapper, it's the launcher wrapper. In essence, you have to send it to the exhorf launch, which is this box up here, which tells the hwarf.launcher.launch function to read all of these files 
and generate the storm number.conf file for that storm. Then the later okay. jobs, the later jobs do not read the parm conf files. They only read the conf files from the com directory. And they generate an hwarf.launcher.hwarf launcher object, which is a subclass of the hwarf config object class name. And that class has a number of utility functions for querying the conf data. There's also an hwarf task, which we'll get to in more detail later. That is that class also has automated ways of querying the conf specifically for information about one particular task in the HWARF system. There's also an hwarf.namelist module for automatically generating Fortran name lists from the configuration files. Here's an example of the configuration file format. This is a trivial configuration file. You can see comments on a line of their own use a hash mark if it's after a key equals value up to the space and then semicolon. They're split up into sections. This section's name is section. And then they're key equals value pairs. So key equal value, key two equal value two. We use Doxygen to generate our documentation website and we've written a script to generate documentation from the conf files. Here's the syntax of those. You have a double hash mark to get the to specify the beginning of a short description, and then a hash mark and blank line followed by the description, the long description, and it uses the doxygen and markdown syntaxes. So you can do sophisticated things like doing a a box that has a note in it, or adding a table, or a million other complicated formatting things. If there's a double semicolon after key equals value, then that just provides a short description of that key. You can also do a long and short description of a key. If you look through to hwarf.conf, you'll see many examples of this. Now, the configuration file is also can also allow string substitution. Here's an example in exe path. It's asking to substitute the base start value here and then exe name value later in the line. Now those substitutions are not done at the time that the file is read. Instead they're done at the time that the exe path variable is queried. So you could actually change what that will return throughout your program if you wanted to by changing exe name or base store or even exe path inside the config parser object that contains all of this config information. Oh, and here is the resulting expansion. As you can see, base star has been substituted slash x6 slash substituting exe name. There's also C printf like formatting. Here you can see gridnum point uh, colon 02d. Gridnum is this 5 over here, and in C printf, the 02d means a an integer that's been zero padded in two digits. So you can see the result is zero five here. And since it's expanding exe path, we get base star substituted first, followed by slash exit, followed by myprog grid, grid num zero two d. So it can recurse. It's possible to get infinite recursion if you specify it incorrectly. There's a maximum recursion depth that'll detect that. And that maximum depth is deep enough so that any reasonable recursion is allowed. You can specify from another section using grid using a section name slash key name. And we automatically substitute from the config and dir section if you're getting a key that can't be found in the current section. So you can see base dir is automatically taken from the dir section. EXE name oh, sorry exe name is here, which goes to gridnum in the config section. Generally, the dir section contains directory paths and sometimes file paths. The config section contains high-level configuration. There's another special section, exe, which contains the path to all executables. Now, as I said before, the files are read in order. 
and anything in the later files overrides earlier files. System.conf is intended to handle per system configurations and you can also use it to have multiple configurations for different environments within the same system like we do with NCO and EMC. The NCO configuration will use the NCO data pads whereas if you look at system.conf.wcost it uses the uh, development paths and the NCO configuration also turns on fallbacks and emailing the senior duty meteorologist whereas EMC did not please don't spam the senior duty meteorologist. You can also specify options or extra comp files when you're running the EXHORF launch or the 1HORF PY. There's two formats. One is to specify the path to a comp file. The other is section.key equals value. So the job that reads these is the EXHORF launch or the JH Wharf launch if you're in EC flow. And it, it creates, at a, deep within the workflow, it's creating a config parser object, which is part of the Python core library that parses the comp files in order. And if that'll have an in memory representation of the combination of all of those five comp files, then it'll add to that all of the user's files and any, any additional options. And that'll be represented, there's a wrapper around the config parser called HWARF launcher, which can do more sophisticated manipulation of config file data. And after that, there's some sanity checks, one on the configuration. It looks like we're missing a step in here that's changed since the last talk. There's now some pre-launch functions, which can make per cycle or per storm modifications automatically. For example, we will use a different configuration in the Central Pacific Basin than in the East Pacific or the Atlantic. So there's an extra file that's read in after the user files are read in before the sanity checks are run. So here's more of that. The EXH fourth launch will make the storm number.conf in the com directory and there's one of these for each storm and operations in the Rokoto workflow, each workflow has only one storm unless you're running the multi-storm configuration, in which case storm one is the fake storm and the ones after that are the real storm. And this storm number.conf contains the processed config data, so it's the result of combining all of the other configuration information into a single file. Later jobs will never read the quorum comp files, they'll never read any options you specify extra on the command line, they will only read the parsed storm number.conf. That lets you make emergency changes to that cycle's comp file, but it also means that if you want to change the parm files and have that affect any cycles that are already on disk, you actually have to rerun those cycles in order to see the effect of the parm changes, unless you make the change directly to the storm number.conf. Oh, and here's my example again. The DFS ENKF failed, so we edited the file to say run DSI equals no, and then resubmitted the forecast and it ran without data assimilation. So the, oh, I didn't forget pre launch in this. All right, so pre launch functions are in the hwarf.prelaunch module. That's USH hwarf pre launch.py. And it's just a set of functions that are run on the configuration object before writing it to disk. And this allows you to provide arbitrary changes to the configuration. For example, there's one group of users that had limited resources, so they wanted to run only a 12-hour forecast for the 6C and 18C cycles, and then run them the whole 126-hour forecast at 0 and 12Z. So they just had to add a pre-launch function with an if statement that changes config forecast link, I think it is, to 12 on the 6 and 18 Z cycles. Now we have some built-in pre-launch functions to, that provide critical functionality that's used in operations, such as using a different configuration on each basin. Now these pre-launch functions are run after your configuration options are processed. So if you want to 
override the effect of a pre-launch function, you actually have to turn off the pre-launch function. And that's done in the case of per basin configurations by setting pre-launch dot basin override equals no. Now in all of the jobs after the launcher, they don't parse the farm files, instead they call hwarf.launcher.load to read the storm whatever dot conf and return an hwarf.launcher.hwarf launcher object. And you can generally use this in place of an hwarf config or even a config parser dot config parser. But the hwarf launcher contains additional convenience functions for doing things like sanity checks. At superclass hwarf config adds some more convenience functions to do things like querying executables, getting the PC vitals information and so on. So here's some of the convenience functions. I'm not saying whether this is for a launcher or a config. You get both of those classes information since HORF launches. HORF launcher is a subclass of HORF config. One example, get star section key. This will return the value of the key option from the section section and it'll return it as a string. It'll raise an exception if that key is not specified in that section. You can specify a default value as the third argument which will be returned if the key is not defined. There's other data types like integer or float. I think there's fractions and dates, dates and uh, there's also a cycle property which returns the forecast cycle as a uh, date time dot date time object which allows you to convert the time to many other formats and there's many more of these utility functions which you can look in the documentation website or just the Python scripts themselves to get a full list. However, usually we don't use the hwarf configure launcher object directly. Instead, we access it to the hwarf task. Now, a task, as I said before, represents a task to be performed, which produces products. Now, we have a subclass of task called hwarf task, which adds some conveniences like, for example, it's connected to the config parser. It's connected to the Python logging and other nice things that just reduce the amount of coding you have to do. Now, there's additional subclasses to perform specific tasks, like a GeoGrid task, which knows how to run GeoGrid. Worf Atmos knows how to run the atmosphere-only Worf configuration. There's also a, uh, there's a task name property for each of these tasks, which returns the name of that ta task in the database and each task has to have a unique name. You can't have a duplicate task name. It'll, there will be an exception raised when initializing HORF EXPT if you try to make two tasks of the same name, because usually that only happens if you're making a mistake while defining the workflow. I can see someone is sending chats. So let me check that. Uh, okay, never mind, it wasn't sent to me. All right, sorry about that. So. Each task has its own configuration section. Generally, the configuration section name is the same as the task name, but you can override that. It has connections to the HORF config or HORF launcher object. And, uh, sorry, focus, all right. There's some convenient aliases that just access the conf object get star can be accessed as conf star key and that'll access the tasks section getting the key of that name from that section and raising an exception if the key isn't defined. You can add the second argument with the default and of course there's uh, additional data types you can query like boolean, int, float and so on. There's an ic star function which does uh, string substitution. You can give it string with these squiggly braces around a key name and it will search the tasks section or the dir and config sections trying to replace it, fix hwarf and gridnum with the value. You can see an example here. 
fixed HORF is home HORF fixed, so it recurses, get passed in solder and substitute fat and gridnum, gridnum, you get this string. There's also time star, which knows how to do time manipulation. It understands there's a forecast time and an analysis time. So by default, the analysis and forecast time are the cycle for the h -worth. You can also specify an integer or a float for the forecast time, and it will be the time relative to the analysis time. So here's some more conveniences. Uh, hold on a second. Right, sorry. Get exe will return. That's used to get an executable name. If you look throughout the HORF scripts, you'll never see us with hard coded paths. We'll always use get exe to get the path to an executable. Get dir, we use this to get special directories and sometimes files when we're naughty. Get loc will query both dir and exe to try to find what you're asking for. Now, in some cases, it's useful to have a, a specific object that has a value set for particular keys. We use this a lot to handle ensemble information. So instead of having 40 sections for our 40 ensemble members with the ensemble BID set different in each one, we just have 40 objects with the same configuration section and locally set the ensemble ID using PV set. So it's as if you had 40 sections with different numbers, except you never have to write those sections in the actual comp files. So there's two different ways of generating Fortran name lists. The name list inserter is the one that's used for the GSI name list, because the vast majority of the GSI name list does not need to be reconfigured. So the name list inserter class expects an input file, and it has special less than greater than brace with a name in between and possibly a data type. And it's going to convert the data type from Unix conf format to Fortran name list format. So you can see here var equals tft in the conf file. We have this input file, name list inserter, we want the var variable. So it's going to go to var, we'll see tft, and convert to dot, true dot, dot, false dot, and dot, true dot. You can specify a data type so it's not automatically guessing. S and R, sorry, it's a data type colon variable name. The S and the R represent float or real in Fortran. I is an integer, S is a string. D and L are Boolean. L stands for logical. A date time is D, which uses the WARF syntax for the date time specification. U will simply insert a string from a comp file without converting it in any way whatsoever. If you don't have the data type, it'll try to guess. The other method of generating nameless is to generate them from scratch without any input at all. And this is what we do with the wharf. It can also you can also use const name list multiple times for multiple sections, and then paste them together in the innermost array direction to make an array input for variables. And that's how we handle multiple wharf domains. So here is an example of const name list for a single domain. So you can see sec1 here sets physics.mp physics and cu physics and so on. The one before the dot is the name of the nameless section. The one after the dot is the name of the Fortran variable. So this would set mp physics equal 95 in the nameless slash physics slash in Fortran code. Now this nameless equals tells it to recurse into sections two and three, and it will produce this nameless when it's written out. Input data is another key thing in configuration files. This is how the HORF knows where to get GFS and other data sets. 
One special section is the HORF data section, which tells it how data is organized in the data staging area. The, there is also an input source class which knows, oh sorry, it skipped something. The data catalog class knows how to find data in one staging area. The input source knows about multiple disk areas that could potentially be on multiple machines or available by FTP or HPFS. It has a list, a prioritized list of data catalogs. So it knows to go, for example, to on-disk areas before going over the network or worse to HPFS. There's an EXHWARF input job. That's, it, this is not in EC flow, it's only in our R&D mode that looks at a specified section in the configuration files to get the input data. And each of these percent location and percent hits bios specify the section that has a data catalog that specifies the actual file and directory locations. And the hist file, higher numbers mean look for this first. Generally, the numbers go from about 30 to about 100. So as I said before, work configuration is based on comp to name list. However, you'll just separately in the Python specify the domain and the full simulation, which is used to make the name list. So this fourth domain comp storm one inner tells us to get the oh, sorry outer tells to get the storm one outer domains information from this configuration section. Storm one inner gets it from a different configuration section and mode gets it from yet another configuration section. Anything that is not set on a per domain basis comes from this section, WARF, because we're using that to make our WARF simulation. And here I specify which domain is the outermost domain, the mode. Mode stands for mother of all domains. That's WARF terminology for your outer domain. And then we're going to tell the WARF to add storm one outer as a subdomain of mode and storm one inner as a subdomain of storm one outer. And from that, it knows how to make the name list. So the resulting name list, you actually have to call another function to underscore name list. And it'll return a string with the actual name list. Here's what the wharf section looks like. This has the information that's on a, that is not for per domain. So here we specify domain, outer domain time step, the boundary input time step, and so on. These are not actually nameless values, but they are converted to nameless values. Anything at the WARF level is data that's needed in order to ensure proper functioning of the workflow in Python objects. Here, nameless equals specifies the section with the actual nameless data. You can see that has familiar nameless values that are copied in to the actual nameless. Now there's some things you're not going to see in these nameless sections, such as anything referring to data locations and uh, time steps and start and end times. Those are automatically generated because they're extremely tedious and error prone if they're done manually. So here's the domain specific information. We've told it to go to a mode section for its information. You can see these are not nameless settings. Instead, they're values that are copied to nameless settings. It's given mode underscore nameless. You can see familiar nameless settings here. Now, this is the outermost domain. If there's settings that are set in this domain and not the inner domains, then they'll be copied to that inner, inner domain. So here's the storm on outer and inner. As you can see, the uh, it follows the same pattern as the mode. You can optionally specify a nameless equals here to override values from the mode. We do that, for example, in the inner domain to turn off the convection scheme. You also have to set the location, the uh, method for determining the start location. Storm one outer is the intermediate domain, and start equals auto mean center on the the domain that's next most inner its immediate child, which is this one, start equals centered, sorry, I said that backwards, start equals auto means use the set ij start program to center on the pg level storm location. Start equals centered means center on the 
immediate parent. In the case of the mode, you'll see start equals mode, which means use the i parent start and j parent start values, which should be one. So are there any questions before I move on to talking about the alternative configurations? I'll assume that means no. And no I'm questions here at HRD. Let me bring up the page. Guides. Hearing H4. All right, so we have a, two pages on alternative configurations. One is the multi-storm, which has detailed information on how to run it. The other is this general HWARF experimentation, XWARF experiment configuration page. Now, there's one important note which I should go over, which is that these alternative configurations sometimes require additional data, which may or may not exist. Everything in existence here, you can run off of the real-time GFS data on the operational WPOS. Some of them are not actually transferred to JAT or FIA. Some of them have a short scrub time on operational WPOS. So 2016 pre-implementation HWARF, this is what is presently in the trunk. If you don't change any settings, this is what you're going to run. You can see it's different depending on the basin. Data assimilation is always done in the North Atlantic. In the East Pack and Central Pack, it's only done when there's tail dots or radar data. So far, I don't think there's been a single flight of the P3 with tail, tail Doppler radar in the Central Pacific Basin. We were told that that was being looked into. Now, the way this works, to change the configuration automatically, there's a separate configuration file that's read in. There is one for the Atlantic Basin. It's empty. And that's to ensure that the otherbasins.conf is not read in. The otherbasins.conf handles the basins that don't have a per basin file which is pretty much all of JTWC. There's also this special South Atlantic Basin, which does not have a clear area of responsibility. And that runs a uh, simplified configuration. We don't even have an ocean domain for this, or we have a completely untested one from Palm, and maybe we have from one from HICOM. We have a smaller vertical structure with a lower model top in JTWC basins, mainly because of Asia, which has complicated terrain. You can still run the operational 2015. This is wrong, or it says none. There's actually an H4 2015 AL.conf, which is needed to ensure Atlantic does not revert to the other basins. The 2015 configuration is very similar. Right now, it differs only in having some missing bug fixes and the longer time step. One exception is that it never runs data assimilation in Central Pacific, even if one of those theoretical TDR flights happen. You can run the full upgraded Atlantic configuration in all basins. And that's done by turning off the pre-launch function that does basin overrides. And you can make sure ensemble 40 member ensemble DA is run by setting this option config the NSDA equals always. Now, there's a, I don't know if you, everyone knows about it, there's a 40 member 18.6 kilometer h -worth ensemble that's run after the h horse cycle finishes, but for, before the next one finishes. And this is the sent as input to the next cycle's GSI job. If you set this option to always, then that will always be run. By default, it's only run if the next cycle has TDR data. You can run the 2015 configuration at three kilometer resolution. You can also run full upgrades in three kilometer, well, all the upgrades except the resolution upgrade. You can force it to run with a 43 level vertical structure. 
and you can also you also have to disable GSI if you do that. GSI requires the higher model top and more vertical levels in order to function correctly. And you can do that at three kilometers, in which case you'll get something similar to the 2013 H4, except with no data assimilation and the newer physics schemes will be enabled. Oh yes, important note here, you have to set these in a, this particular order, otherwise it'll get confused. There is a safety check that will abort if you try to load three kilometer before 43 level, it'll scold you. There's a GEFS based ensemble of the H4. It has to be run without data assimilation. We recommend it be run at three kilometer just because it's way too expensive to run at two kilometer. Here's the instructions for that. It just takes the 21 members of GEFS, that's member zero is the control, one through 20 are the perturbed members. And we run this in real time every year. Zan Zhang runs it on jet. You can change the forecast length. Anything from 12 to 126 should work. It will. It should also work up to 192 hours without significant modification. Just make sure you have the data available. In theory, you should be able to run up to 384 hours if you run off of grid files with the 43 level configuration. You can change the physics schemes. This will enable the scale-aware SAS, which is experimental. Wei Gu Wang and Zhang Zhang are working on retuning that for the H4 for high resolution. Right now, it's kind of tuned for low-res GFS. You can run the new GFS PBL with eddy momentum flux using this option. You can turn on SAS in all domains using the old SAS by overriding the name list inner uh, physics section, CU physics option. Thompson Microphysics is also available. We're testing that. Actually, DTT is testing that. You can run physics every time step or whatever your favorite frequency is. This will run at every time step. That's not recommended because the advection is run every other time step. It's better to run it every two time steps instead. Just make sure you, oh, sorry, movement should be end track here. I'll update that after this meeting. We changed movement to end track to reduce confusion. End track or the old movement is the option that sets how often to run the uh, decision on whether to move the domain. You can disable parts of the system. This, these pair of options will disable GSI. Make sure you disable the ensemble DA also, otherwise you'll run a 40 member ensemble for nothing. You can disable the ensemble DA with, but leave GSI enabled, in which case it'll use the GFS ENKF output directly. You can disable ocean coupling. You can also disable initialization entirely and run directly off of the GFS analysis. You can run without spectral files. However, to do that, you have to disable GSI, which requires the GFS spectral files. Sam, I would like to mention that um, we recently worked it out so that you can do this, but you cannot run um, with the ensemble. So you would run in 3D VAR only if you disable um, Sorry, in that configuration, you would run with 3D VAR only. Okay, well, please add that to this page. There's one other uh, sure, important yeah. bit. Hold on, let me find it. Okay, multi storm configuration. This might take too long to explain for this uh, for this uh, meeting or this presentation, but we have a multi storm version of H4 where you have a large outer domain with one pair of inner domains for each storm. And there's some extra options you need to specify to run hwarf.py, this in particular, and this lowercase m and capital M, L comma E. L and E are the basins to include. Theoretically, you can also do C for some storms. L is North Atlantic, E is Northeast Pacific. 
And when you do this config run multi storm, yes, it's going to automatically pull some extra parm slash store.conf files in order to start the multi storm configuration. There's also additional changes to the wharf name list that happen automatically in order to use a more intelligent MPI arrangement that runs multiple storms in parallel instead of doing it recursively like the older version of Wharf did. And I think that's about all I have on configurations. Are there any questions about alternative configurations? Uh-oh, is anyone still there? Yeah, Sam, I, I have a quick question. Um, how easy or hard is it right now to uh, change the nest size? Like, let's say you wanted to do uh, a nest over a cold load in the middle of the Atlantic, and you wanted to make sure that the, that the nest was larger. I mean, is that something that, that how, is that hard coded throughout, or is that something you can easily change in the constraint? I'm hearing an awful echo, but I think you. But I think you. Uh, sorry, could everyone, sorry, could everyone mute their phones? Mute their phones? Echo. Ah, okay. Echo is gone. So I think the question. Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I was just asking if how easy or hard it is to change the the size of the nests. If let's say you know we wanted to do an experiment where we put one of the nests over a, a bigger feature, so we wanted to make the the D02 and D03 larger. I'm just giving an example. Is that easy to do, or is that hard coded throughout? Yeah, that's that's easy. You just have to edit. Uh, can you see my screen? You have to edit yeah, these yeah. numbers, these numbers. Okay, so just play around with those to get the size I want, and as long as D03 fits in D02, I shouldn't have an issue, right? Yes. So be aware if you make the nest phenomenally large, you may start to hit file size limits. And yeah, you may yeah. also run into that quilt bad tag issue and have to add additional IO servers per group. But you'd have to go to really phenomenally big domains to have that problem. You may also need to increase the wall clock limit. Okay, duly noted. Thank you. All right, are there other questions? So let's see what the next talk is. Seven, eight, oh, Ricotto. Christina will talk to us about Ricotto. Christina will talk to us about Rakoto after lunch, I believe. Um, so that's scheduled for 1.30, and I think we should be good for breaking for lunch until 1.30 um, and resuming resuming the call then. Is everybody okay with that? Good to go? Sounds good. Sounds good. All right. Well, maybe... Maybe start it up five or ten minutes early. Is that yeah, okay, Gus? Okay. All right. Maybe just five. We know everything kind of works, and I I don't want to cut your lunch short. So. Okay. View at one thirty. The talks concerning just overview topics are going to be covering Rakoto for HWARF. Uh, Sam's going to talk about the database. And then um, I'll just go through some options for uh, running HWARF in, in different modes uh, when you're trying to debug uh, changes. So I'll get started with the, the Rakoto for HWARF uh, presentation here. And go with the slideshow. All right. So this talk's going to cover uh, just an introduction to Rakoto, how it works um, in terms of using the XML scripts, and um, then effectively using Rakoto to run HWORF and how to uh, get some more information out of the system on the status of your jobs and that kind of thing. And um, talk about some of the, maybe talk about some of the activities that you can do with, with uh, Rakoto. So Rakoto's job is uh, to manage your workflow, um, where a workflow is just defined as a collection of interconnected steps uh, employed to 
accomplish an overall goal. In this case, it's all of the steps required to get uh, a forecast for HWORF out the door. So uh, Rakoto is the workflow manager that we use. Uh, it's not the only one HWORF uses. As we've mentioned earlier, we can also use wrappers, or, uh, which is not really a workflow manager or EC flow like they do in operations, but um, Rakoto is just the way that we do it uh, if we're not operations, and it's a, a mean of defining the workflow, as I mentioned, and an automation of that workflow execution. So it's capable of doing many things that we wouldn't want to do uh, by hand, like tracking dependencies, checking the job status, including any failures, resubmitting those failed jobs, um, not submitting them after they failed a certain number of times, and that sort of thing. So uh, I showed you this outline before. Uh, I just want to mention that Rakoto operates by submitting each of these tasks in order when their dependencies have been met. So um, it can't move on to the next box as the arrow points until it has completed uh, successfully the previous box or enough of the previous box to uh, start the next box. So Rakoto works by uh, being run several times um, and every time it runs it checks the completion of any jobs that were already submitted and decides whether any more jobs can be submitted um, depending on their dependencies. And you continue submitting this uh, run command until all the tasks have completed. So this whole list should have been completed um, by the time uh, or you should get everything done uh, by the end where the completion task is. So uh, I just wanted to introduce the XML in, uh, script and uh, explain how Rakoto uses XML to define the workflow. It uh, can set tasks and interdependencies for those tasks. Yeah. Sorry, can you guys mute your phones, please? And then um, it also has the ability to set the runtime requirements and automation controls. So there are several XML components that are uh, pretty important. Every uh, XML workflow script needs a header. It has entities, which are just kind of environment variables used within uh, XML. And then uh, so several important tags that uh, you should know about just so that uh, you know everything lives in the workflow tag. Uh, you can set the the location of the Rakoto log file with the log tag. Cycle string is just going to reference the current cycle that is running. Um, the cycle def defines a set of cycles that you want to be running for the entire workflow. So this could be one cycle or many cycles. Um, a task is just the job submission portion of the workflow. Meta task is a collection of tasks. So there is um, some documentation on GitHub for Rakoto and Chris Harrop has been the primary developer of that and keeps it um, decently up to date. So you can check out this link for more information about using Rakoto. So this is just an example. It um, is not up to date with the necessarily with uh, the trunk or the, the branch that I gave you, but I just wanted to show you that uh, we do have a header at the beginning of the, the workflow uh, HWORF XML example and uh, so in that template we're going to be setting some HWORF system variables that we need. Uh, there are some variables that are included that come from the Rakoto uh, files. So these are the entities here um, such as uh, sites, tasks, storms, all of those are defined by other entity files within the Rakoto directory um, and also by the run hwerf.py script. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there are uh, lots of entities that are defined from the configuration variable. So these are coming directly in from uh, all those PARM uh, files that Sam was explaining to us earlier. So these get 
uh, updated by running the run hrf.py script and placing these into the template. So um, <clears throat> here I'm going a little bit further down into the workflow of the template uh, once it's been filled in. And uh, here we see the workflow has a couple of different uh, options set in there. And <clears throat> cycle throttle is an important one to set. It's uh, going to limit the number of cycles that you'll be running at one time. Because if you submit a workflow in Rakoto that uh, starts with several jobs that don't have any other dependencies, then all of those will be submitted. So if you're submitting an entire season, then all of those first jobs will be running at the same time. And you really want to limit that to a handful so that we're not overcrowding the system and, and causing problems in that way. Uh, task throttle is similar, but this is going to limit the number of tasks that you'll be running at any given time. So it's not necessarily limited just to a number of cycles, but also to a number of tasks in a given cycle. Um, here is uh, the cycle def, uh, the second thing I'm pointing out here, and that's just going to tell us that we're running one uh, cycle here. It starts and ends at the same time, so that's one cycle you can end it at a different time for, um, for uh, multiple cycles. You also give it an interval. Um, there are several ways that you can do this. You can define several sets of cycles if you would like. Um, but we don't really do that in uh, the HWARF scripts. So, uh, like I mentioned, we have a log tag here, and that just sets the directory for the logs from coming from Rakodo, um, and that is uh, that's in our standard configurable log HWARF location. And then we start with a meta task. A meta task, like I mentioned, is a, a group of tasks that run um, as maybe a chunk of the, the system. In this case, this is a whole meta task that includes the initialization procedure, so all the way up through merge. Um, if we look into one of these tasks, we'll see several other tags. Um, all of these tags up at the beginning of the task are queue tags. They're going to set all of the requirements needed by the batch system. Uh, we'll export some environment variables that are included in, in uh, these extra files here. Uh, these entities point to the files uh, in, in uh, the Rakoto area. And let's see. Uh-oh. Did not mean to do that. Sorry about that. Um, go back here. And uh, then we have some dependencies. So we have several different options for uh, setting dependencies. And those include things like, has another task completed or has it been submitted? Uh, you can have meta task dependencies. Here, there's also a string uh, dependency on whether a certain variable is set to yes or yes or no. So um, many different options for dependencies. Here I go a little bit more in depth on that. Uh, so a task dependency just means did, did one of the tasks complete, and if so, um, can we go ahead and run this one? Uh, you can do a cycle offset here too, so that you're checking the task of a previous cycle to see if it completed. Uh, meta task is just did a whole group of tasks complete uh, successfully. You can have data dependencies, so is there a file on disk somewhere? Um, and you can set age and minimum size for that file to make sure that you know it's completely finished writing and, and everything is, is going well there. So um, let's see, a time dependency just means it can't run until a certain time of day, and that's important for some operational uh, tasks. Uh, we want to make sure in some cases that a cycle exists, so um, if the previous cycle exists, we have a little bit of a different setup than if it does not exist. Uh, and then uh, an SH tag will give you a grep dependency if 
um, you need to find out if uh, a flag file contains a certain string, you can do that with uh, this flag. So uh, that's a little bit about the XML language that we're using for uh, defining the workflow, but then once we actually have a workflow to run, uh, we need to have some tools to use with that. So uh, the basis of all this is that we have a Rakodo run command. We give it an XML file and it writes out a database file. Um, the first time it's run is when you get the database file um, and it will continue to update that database file each subsequent time that it runs. You do have to continue running it several times to complete the entire workflow. Um, and I typically suggest that you run it manually the first few times to make sure everything's set up okay and your jobs are running and then once you're confident that you have the system uh, set up appropriately then you can use the cron, uh, cron job to uh, continue submitting it at regular intervals. So each time you run Rakodo run uh, it does the same set of things. It reads the database file specified in the D flag uh, it queries the batch system for the current state of the workflow, and then it takes some action based on what the re return from the query was. So it can resubmit crash jobs, submit jobs for tasks whose dependencies are not satisfied. Um, it will then save the current state of the workflow to the database file specified by the D flag, and then quit. So this is a case where you might get a different status in uh, the database than you have if you did just a QSTAT on your jobs. It's not going to update the database until it runs Rakodo run again. Um, if you do a QSTAT with your username, you can see what jobs have actually been seeing, what are running in, uh, in the batch system. A Rakodo stat uh, gives you the information included in the database file on the status of each of your jobs. It'll give you an entire list for a cycle here. Um, if you define your cycle with the C flag and uh, you can define multiple cycles here and get uh, a long list of these status uh, entries. There are lots of options for the state. Uh, you get succeeded, running, submitted, failed, dead, and unknown. Um, so the problematic ones are failed and it if it hasn't reached the maximum number of tries, um, it will continue to submit until it fails up until the maximum number of tries, and it's going to be in the state dead. After that, um, it won't continue to submit anything um, for that job. Unknown typically just means that it's been too long since uh, it had an accurate reading of that job, and it's not in the history of the queuing system anymore. Um, so Rakodo check gives us even more information about a specific task. Here we include the dash T with the task name um, and we get all kinds of information here including the state of the particular one, if the dependencies have been met. This is uh, Typically why I use a Rakodo check, I want to know if it's a dependency issue. Um, it'll also tell you where all your files are be being written to uh, for the standard error, standard out uh, kind of things. Rakodo boot is important if you have found that you need to, to submit a job again. Uh, regardless of the dependencies being met, then you can use a Rakodo boot on a sp specific task. Rakodo Rewind will um, remove any evidence of having run the, the task prior to um, running the re Rewind command. So this just clears the database of the specified task, resubmits the jobs that have any dependencies met. It will kill jobs that are already running or in the queue uh, related to the task that you're rewinding. And um, it is important to mention that rewinding the launcher will delete your com directory and your work directory. So be very careful with rewinding the entire cycle. If you don't want those gone, then uh, you definitely don't want to rewind the launcher. Um, and that includes using the dash A option to rewind the entire cycle at once. Um, 
so that was all I was going to say about the uh, Rakoto tools for running HWARF. Uh, were there any questions or concerns at this point? Also, would like to make sure that people can hear me. We can hear you. Okay, just making sure. Uh, I hadn't heard sounds for a little while. I was getting a little concerned. Um, so, uh, because HWARF is such a complex system and has so many configurable options, it was important that we have a layer over the Rakodo to um, set up this configuration. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that Rakodo, as of right now, does not have any branching capability. So there aren't any logical structures that say uh, if, if, then, or while, or anything like that. Um, so we want to be able to set up this template so that we can plug in our options and, and do things in a very configurable way. Um, so this Python layer on top of Rakoto populates the XML template that matches your configuration and removes the burden of having as many human errors uh, in matching those configurations as possible. Um, if you look into the HWARF Rakoto directory, you're going to see uh, several files and subdirectories. Um, I just wanted to mention what those are here. Um, the depths subdirectory uh, gives you uh, several files that are just a more complex set of dependencies that are required by some of the some of the tasks um, and it's just a, a way to organize and clean up rather than to have these repeated in in multiple task files um, the envars and msvars.ent files are just uh, Rakoto specific environment variables, and they set the um, and they're set through the config after running the run hwork.py. Uh, forecast procs and forecast ENT and PY files are there so that we can have a more easily configured list of uh, forecast processors. Uh, it's very specific in each configuration how many processors are needed for a forecast. So there are beginning to be a lot of configurations that require a lot of different uh, for, uh, processor layouts for the forecast. So this handles that situation. Um, there are two XML uh, templates. There's one for the multi-storm and one for everything else. And uh, these just define the standard workflows for those two different options. Uh, hopefully one day we will have these combined into one, but as for right now, uh, there are two separate ones. There are also two separate uh, subdirectories called multi-storm tasks and tasks. These are just the XML files for each HWARF task, and um, these are still separate right now. Uh, again, hopefully we will have those uh, combined in, in future versions. Um, run hwork.py is where all the magic happens. It gets the environment variables from the comps needed by Rakoto. Uh, it checks for a TC vital record for the cycle that you're running or a set of cycles that generates the XML from the template. Um, or it uses the existing if one already uh, exists. And it loads the modules and issues the Rakoto run command. So all of this is to set up everything that you need in order to issue Rakoto run. So you never technically have to type Rakoto run into the into the terminal. You just run uh, run hwork.py. Uh, you can do that using the run hwork wrapper or do it or, or do it uh, manually in in the um, command line. And then sites is just a, a set of files containing the variables specific to known machines, and any machine can really be added uh, by using one of these as a template and and updating it as long as Rakoto exists on that machine. So, um, in order to run Rakoto for HWARF, uh, you this is all set up in run HWARF uh, wrapper, and uh, all of these arguments are nearly the same as those that you would submit for the EX hwerf launch.py script, um, except here we also have a dash w and dash d option if you would like to name your own XML uh, and database files. Uh, otherwise, a, a 
standard one will be set for you. You pass it the date, the storm you want to run, um, several other options that I've listed here, and uh, it sets up the entire configuration as it's set up in the config. You can also pass it um, other configuration options one at a time here if you like, instead of passing it an entirely new um, set of, uh, or an entirely new comp file. Um, there are dash little m dash big m options for running multi-storm. You also need a config run multi-storm equals yes option in there. Uh, the Rakoto logs by default are located in the um, log directory under your uh, uh, work hwerf area. And sorry, one up from work hwerf, but uh, it contains records of the Rakoto task when they were submitted um, and their status at the time that uh, Rakoto run was run. Here I have an example. Um, all of these things in green happened at the same submission time, so uh, 39 minutes after the hour. Uh, we're uh, determining the submission status of the previously pending jobs, um, check, seeing that they're either running or succeeded, and then um, submitting the next available GDAS jobs. And we do, do that process every three minutes in Micron tab. So at 42 after the hour, uh, we're checking to see um, what the submission status of the previous jobs were and see if we can run anything else. So um, the first time that you run hwork.py, it does generate the XML code and it lives in Rakoto. It invokes the Rakoto run um, command, which generates the database. Um, every few minutes, you submit a cron job uh, using the dash f argument, and uh, it will continue to to update and run Rakoto run. Uh, it does not overwrite the data. Yes. One correction here, it will overwrite the XML file, oh. and it will update the database file. The XML file is updated every time you run, run hwarf.py. That's uh -huh. why we're able to run this for parallels, because it has to change the cycle def tags every time new cycle is used or generated in the TC files like the SDM. Gotcha. So um, it doesn't, it's only updating the database and it does rewrite the XML file. Yes. If you haven't changed any configuration options, the XML file should not be changing every three minutes still. It will in forecast mode because the TC vitals will be changing oh. every few hours. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, then like I've mentioned a couple of times, you run HR for the cron job. Uh, you can use cron tab minus E to edit your jobs and set up the uh, frequency with which you would like to run the run hwork.py. And that's all I have for the Rakoto discussion today. Uh, are there any any questions about using Rakoto? Okay. Um, if not, then we can move on to Sam's presentation I will on the database and I will transfer present uh, transfer controls to him. Do you have them, Sam? See. Can people see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so I'll be talking about the HORF database and some related issues about product and tasks data delivery. So first, why do we have this thing and what is it? And then I'll go on to the uh, specifics and the data store module as well as the HWARF task and what goes on related to the database and the HWARF EXPT. So the old KSH-based scripts from 2014 and before had huge file system overheads 
and that's due to the way in which we detect whether files are available. So in, uh, it, there's a few examples of it on these slides, but in essence, when one job generates stuff, another job is waiting for it. The only way it can detect if the files are available is to query the file system over and over. And that resulted, this not an exaggeration, there were actually millions of SAT and open door reader calls per cycle. So instead, we're using a database which stores the availability information. And in nearly every case, we're able to just query the database to see if the file is available. And each one of these files has a location and an availability flag. Sometimes there's other information Sometimes there's additional files. For example, if we deliver a grib file, so deliver the index file or files, and some of them will have an expected minimum file size and age for verification purposes. So here is internally what the database looks like. An SQLite 3 database is simply a set of tables. And we have two tables. One is the products table, and the other is the metadata table. And I have some example data in here. So you see geogrid colon colon geo nmm nest. Geogrid is the name of the task that produces the product, and geo nmm nest is the name of the product within that task. Available is zero. That means the uh, product is not available yet. It uses one for available and zero for not available and then has the location on disk where the product should be. That can be changed later on by updating the database. Type is product or task. There's some other types you can put in. It's just the name of the Python class that is used to represent that information. In the metadata, you can see the ID column contains the product for which the metadata refers, and the key is the metadata name, and value is the value for that metadata. And in the actual H4 fork flow, you would have probably hundreds of products with perhaps as many as a couple thousand metadata values, mostly for crib data. So here is an example of how a new product is created. In the top box, I have the Python code. Now, you would never use the product class directly. Instead, you use some subclasses that I'll show later, though you can use the product class directly. So here, prod is the name of the variable that will return, that will contain the new product in memory. Product is the name of the class that we're instantiating. DS is the data store object, which is the, our connection to the database. Geo NMM nest is the name of the product. GeoGrid is the name of the task. Here's the location, the availability flag, and the type that we're setting for this and here is the SQL codes that we send to the LibSQL Lite 3 library. Insert or ignore into that says that we want to create a new row unless the row is already present, in which case we ignore it and don't make any changes. Here's the table products and values are here. Now, this first column, GeoGrid, GeoNMM Nest, is there's only one row that's allowed to have that value. So if I try to insert another row into this table with the same ID, it'll cause an error, and insert or ignore will not add anything. Here's an example of changing the location and availability. You can actually change these independently, but we have a convenience function that changes them at the same time. So you can see insert or replace into. That means that if GeoGrid, GeoNM, um, Nest is already present, it will be replaced with these new values. So you can see the availability is now one. Here's an example of adding metadata. It uses the standard array syntax. So you just do pod min size equals whatever. And we can also print the value of this min size. Now, when we print the value, that's going to use cached information. The 
Python code will cache information for up to 30 seconds. Once the cache is 30 seconds old, it'll discard it and grab a new piece of information from the database. A note that so wrapper is a function in Python that points a kind of Pythonic representation. So this will point all of these numbers with quotes around it because the data store module always converts metadata back to a string. So if you want an integer or a date or something, you'll have to convert this back to your expected data type. Here is the SQL code that will happen when you set the min size on this line. Insert or replace, just like we did with the uh, location and availability, except it's modifying the metadata table. And it will set geo grid, geo NMM, nest, min size as this. Now, metadata has Metadata can accept many keys with the same ID, but you can never have a row with the same key and ID value. So in other words, you can have 100 products with the same key, but you can't have a product with two copies of the same key. So here is an example for querying both location and availability. So I'm creating a new copy of this product and you still have to specify a location availability type and such if you're using the product class directly. And we're going to print the location and availability. And it prints new location true, which differs from path to file available false. So why is it doing this? Well, it's because of this insert or ignore into. It's because of the or ignore part. That tells the SQLite 3 that if this key, GeoGrid, Geo, NMM, Nest, is already present, don't modify the information. Now, the reason that we do this is the HWART EXPT module, which contains a complete description of the entire workflow, including all of the products from the wharf before we even get to the wharf step, and the post, the ocean, and everything is created in advance. So every time you run any job, it's going to recreate those products and tasks in memory. And you have to make sure it doesn't clobber the database contents. And so anything we set in the constructor is only going to be written to the database if the product does not already exist in the database. So if you want to actually set the location and availability in the constructors, then you need to do it in the next line and explicitly assign the location and availability. Now, as I said before, you would never actually use the product class directly. Instead, there is subclasses of product with, uh, with an implementation of things like file delivery. One of those is file product, which represents a file that's delivered by your workflow. And you can see the arguments are the same. I think type equals product is optional. And it works the same way internally, insert or ignore into blah, blah, blah. However, it has two utility functions. One is deliver, which uses the fraud util file op deliver file function, which we talked about a couple hours ago. That's a magic function that can deliver a file without leaving an, an incomplete copy in the destination. There's also an undeliver, which tells it to clear the information from the database. And if you set delete to true, which is the default, it'll also delete the delivered file. Both of these have a logger op optional argument, which we strongly suggest you set. That will allow it to log the process of delivering or undelivering the file. When delivering, there's also a copy or argument so that you can convert the file while copying. That's what we use to convert from NetCDF3 to compress NetCDF4 when delivering the COM. Upstream file is for the unique case where you are, are taking a file from an external workflow. For example, if you're waiting for RTOS to generate from some files, but you need it to be marked in your database, you would make an upstream file for that RTOS file. And that uses the bad old method of checking file system for the minimum size and age. But this does it with the minimum possible 
work because it will record the existence and location of the file in the database so that any any later checks of that file in any other job will just have to check the database instead of checking the file's existence and size. And you can set various uh, requirements like a size and age. I think we actually have modification and access age separate. And there's an undeliver, but that doesn't actually delete the upstream file. It just sets the availability to false in the database. So any future calls to check will actually check for the file again. And you cannot deliver an upstream file, of course, since an upstream file is one that's delivered by an external workflow. So next to the task. So tasks are also stored in the products and metadata tables in the database. You create them using the task class constructor. There's a data, sorry, there's the data store object again, which has the connection to the database. This is the name of the task, and it'll have this weird double star task double star prepended to it to make sure it doesn't accidentally conflict with a bizarre name for a product. The Available column is used in a different way for tasks. Instead of representing availability, it'll represent the state of the tasks, such as is the task running, has the task failed, and so on. You can set a location. The location is the directory in which the task is running. Now, there's various states. 10, for example, is running. 0 means it hasn't started yet. 30 is completed. And when you create a task, it, it, uh, sorry, when you set the task state, it'll use update or ignore products set available equals. It's using, as I said, available to store the state. And it's storing the task information in the products table. Here's an example of how that is useful. So the first line here, I create a new task. Then we have a try accept block. In Python, a try accept block is used to guard code that might fail. So you put the code that might fail between try and accept. And if an exception is raised, then we get into the accept block. So here at the, try, the top of the try, I change the database so it says the task is running. I do whatever it is the task is supposed to do deliver all of its products and so on and so forth, and then set the task to be completed. But if doing things causes a failure, for example, an IO error, then it'll jump to this accept block without reaching the assignment to complete it. So it'll jump straight from do things to task.state equals failed. That way the rest of the workflow knows the task is not failed, is not running, it's failed. And then raise just tells it to raise the exception again so that the job will fail with a non-zero exit status and print a stack trace back so that everyone knows what went wrong. Unfortunately, this simple try accept block doesn't do several important things. We're not telling anyone what products the task creates. They have to go into the, actually read that. We are not connecting this to the script the script slash ex whatever dot ty level, level. We're not logging anything. We don't provide any way to sim simply reconfigure the task. Instead, you have to manually edit the script yourself. And you can get a lot of this to be done for you automatically if you subclass hwarf task instead of subclassing task. So here's an example of subclassing hwarf task. I've highlighted the important bits in blue. I'll be going over the various aspects of this block of code in the next few slides, so you don't need to read it right now. So in the first line, class simple geogrid hwarf task. It says that we're declaring a new task simple geogrid that derives from hwarf task. And there's a few things that we're gaining from subclassing that. One is that we have a few special directories and files that are now assigned to us. One is self.outdir, that's the delivery location for all of the products. 
Another is self.workdir, which is the temporary location that's not listed here. Yet another thing is that we have a logging, a Python logging domain assigned to us so that if we do self.log.error, it'll say that it's coming from simple GeoGrid instead of just saying the logging message here. This exc info equals true tells it every time it prints this error, it should also print the stack traceback. And of course, that stack traceback will come with the line at which the problem originated, the message, and the name of the task that caused the problem. So there's a few other properties that you get automatically from h task. You have the output directory, the scrub area, the task name, the section in the configuration files that configures this task, the HWARF data store object that uh, has the database connection as well as the database identifier. Note that if you create any product for this task, you should use the task name as the category. That's the part before the double colon in the product name. So let's go over more things in that code example. So this line, the double underscore in it, blah, 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 this defines, this declares the constructor, which is the function that's automatically called when you create a new simple geogrid. And I'll go over the contents of this soon. The other important function is products. This is an iterator that will iterate over all of the products that this class delivers. This class is a simple geogrid, so it only delivers the geogrid product, which we create up here. Third important function here is run, which is the standard function that runs whatever it is that simple GeoGrid does. All of the tasks have a run function and a products function and a constructor. Now, inside this constructor, there's a few things. I forgot to highlight this line, which calls the superclass constructor, super blah, 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 dot in it. This will call the HWARF task constructor. You'll see a line like this in the HWARF task constructor that runs the, um, sorry, can everyone still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, hopefully that will continue to be the case because I'm getting a call from Rhode Island. Sometimes my phone hangs up on people when I have another call. So we create the only one and only product here, which is a file product for the file that our simple GeoGrid will create. Here's self.dstore, we're sending the connection to the database. GeoNMM nest is the name of the product within our task. Self.task name is sending the category of product, which should almost always be the name of the task. And we're setting our prediction for the location. Remember, if this is the second time through your job or through any job, then this location will not be propagated to the database because the database already exists with a location set. But we don't need to override the location since it's set correctly the first time. The product, as I said, this yield this iterates over all one of our products. And down here is the line where we actually deliver it near the end of our try try accept block. And since we're using a file product, calling the deliver function just automatically copies the data to the location. Apparently that's the end of my presentation. I should tell you, you can also see the try accept block around this. So inside the run function, we still have the assignment of running completed or failed, as well as some sort of logging. And if an exception is raised, you should re-raise the exception so that it's reported when the job exits. Oh, sorry, there is more. I was just ignoring my keyboard for a second. Yes, so here's everything I just said. And when you do a task.state equals, that is going to force an update of the database in that availability column. Running is actually the number 10, completed is 30, and failed is negative 10. So worth inputs and outputs. The worth uses these uh, products and tasks extensively. 
but we have primary and backup data sources, so we have to do things a bit more intelligently than some of the rest of the system. Now, we have a million different ways of running WARF within the HWARF system. The uh, data assimilation has to run several little WARF runs, and of course you have the coupled versus uncoupled WARF, you have the base and scale WARF. So we have many of these classes that implement different ways of running WARF. And instead of rewriting the class each time to do the entire job of rerunning WARF, we just have a base class, WARF task space, that implements most of the logic for running WARF or the real NMM. So here is, here's a pair of simple examples. You have to run real NMM before you run the WARF. So real equals real NMM. You send it the data store, the configuration, the conf is the in-memory representation of the storm number.conf file. And then here's the name of the configuration section. We use WARF exe for nearly all of the WARF executions, with the one exception of the main forecast, which uses the run WARF. The WARF here is the WARF simulation object, which des describes the simulation to be run, and task name is the name of this task in the database. Now you can see the WARF ANL, which is a one-minute simulation of WARF, looks almost the same. It just uses a different class and a different task name. These all have to have different task names, or you'll get an exception. That exception is raised as a safeguard in order to make sure you don't accidentally clobber database entries from another task. Now, these two classes derive from the same WARF task base. The only differences are that they modify, they copy and modify this WARF simulation object to run their particular simulation. For example, WARF ANL is going to send, set the time limit to one minute after the start time and enable the WARF ANL file output. Real NMM is going to use the standard WARF simulation. It's not going to change it in any way, but it'll run the real NMM program. One interesting piece here is that we call anl.addreal real. So what is this? Add real tells the WARF ANL object to get the various outputs that it needs, various inputs that it needs from, sorry, let me go back tells it to get its inputs from this real NMM object. The real NMM outputs, for example, WARF input, there's a WARF DDY, if you're coupling, and there's a fort.65, and there's some other, several other files, depending on what you're doing. And it tells the ANL that it can get those files from the real object. Internally, the way that works is that the WARF task base has this add real function, and it has a list of inputs that it knows it can get from real. It adds them in sequence. It says you can get the fort.65 file from this object. You can get the warp input from this object, and so on. Now the add warp input calls add input and set, sends it a new object warp input to warp, which is just a simple wrapper around warp input at time. Now, that's a lot to take in, but this WARF input at time is the key piece. There's a whole bunch of classes throughout the HWARF system that have a function WARF input at time, and then the analysis time and domain. And by having that function declared in your class, it tells all of the WARF and real simulations that they can get a WARF input file from your class. So the merge has this, the relocation has this, the real NMM, the GSI, they all have a WARF input at time function. You can see an example of that at real NMM. It checks to see if this is the right time and domain, and if so, it returns the uh, product inside its class for the WARF input file. Otherwise, it returns none, so that the, uh, the calling class can go to its backup locations to get an alternative WARF input. So backup inputs. So if you look at the real WARF object, which is the uh, the main 
simulation object, then uh, you'll see multiple add morph inputs. One will add the output of the GDAS merge. The other one will out add the output of the GFS analysis relocation. That means that if the GDAS merge fails, we can go to the GDAS and out the GFS analysis relocation to get the wharf input instead. And you can see the same wharf input at time function declared in the relocation task. And it looks the same. There should actually be a else return none here after it. But this is probably not the full function anyway. Oh, sorry. I was incomplete. Relocation task of the superclass of the various relocation and merge. So as a simplification, we call get wharf input. So in the subclasses, the relocate stage three or merge, they return their own product objects for the wharf input. Hold on a second. So there's there are many different ways of running the wharf, especially if you add interesting things like coupling or IAU. If you look at the wharf task base class, you can see a full list of the possible objects. They all have the capability of having primary and backup data sources. There is some other classes that use a similar pattern for getting primary and backup data sources, such as the GSI and relocation. And apparently that was my last slide. So do we have any questions? Oh, we do. It looks like uh, Terry McGinnis wants to know where the task-based file dependencies are specified. I'm not sure what he means by that. So job dependencies are specified at the proto and EC flow level. The, the flow of information within the scripts are specified in the HORF EXPT module. And we had to move some of that implementation down to the HORF system module, which is just a helper module for HORF EXPT. So if you look in those two modules, the HORF EXPT and the HORF.HORF system, you'll see a lot of these creations of objects and calling add BORF input or add whatever else, along with all of the if statements necessary to handle the various possible h fourth configurations. So are there any other questions? Yeah, this is Ben. I Can can't understand. Ben, is that you? I have a question. Yeah, it's me. I have a question regarding the uh, database table. Are all those uh, files and products and the tasks stored in the same table? All right. So in the in the single storm HWARF workflow without GEFS, there's a single HWARF database. There's two tables. One has the product is one is the products table, which has product and task availability, state, and location. The other is the metadata. So each database can only have one table of a particular name. So in the single storm, non-ensemble workflow, yes, everything is in one database. Now, if, if you do the, if you do the multi-storm HWARF, then having a single database results in too much file lock contention and database contention. So DDC actually split it out into one database per storm, plus another database for the uh, part of the workflow that runs the multi-storm forecast. And if you run the GEFS-based ensemble, then each of the 21 HWARF ensemble members has its own database. And right, uh, yes. if you recall way, the so task... All the... Sorry, go um, ahead. Yeah, by the way, for, for all the cycles, 
the database is a single file for, for one storm. No, no. Right. Each storm and each cycle has its own database. Okay, I see. It's in the work directory for that storm and cycle. And then each storm and each cycle has its own work directory. So they each have their own database. In principle, you can have as many databases as you want. If you recall the constructor for task and product, you actually send the database connection in for each one. So you could have more database files, and that's how we split it up for the ensemble and the multi-storm. We just send in more objects, more databases. So if, if there's no other questions, I'll hand this over to Christina. Um, hi, Sam. I did have a question. Who is this? This is Javier from HRD. So my okay. question is, um, when you create um, an object that's a, a subclass of um, of HWORF task, do you need to manually do anything to the database, or are you just, well, uh, apart from setting the state, or do you That is all, let me go back to that slide. So in the constructor of your subclass of HWORF task, you call the constructor of HWORF task as well. In its constructor, it'll call the constructor for task, which will call the constructor for datum, which will magically set up the connection to the database for you. Now, if you want to do things like change the state to running or failed, you have to call self.state equals running or failed. If you want to change metadata, you have to do self uh, bracket metadata name and bracket equals value. So the creation of the new entry in the database is automatic, but if you want to update the information, then you do have to do that. You have to code it. Oh, okay. But there's there's functions to make it easy, like set location oh. and such. Okay. And um, another thing for products, when we when we instantiate a product, is, does that automatically also update the database? Yes, but remember, for both tasks and products, anything you set in your constructor will not be set in the database unless that product had not yet been added to the database. Okay. So, so if you want to change the location or availability or the task state, then you have to explic explicitly do self.location equals something after the constructor. Okay. Usually you don't want to do that though, at least in constructors. So are there other questions? No? Okay, I think the next presentation is Christina's. Indeed. Somewhere here. So okay. I'm unsharing my screen. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll transfer. Thank you, Gus. Okay, so this is the last uh, real informative talk on general topics for today, um, and I just wanted to uh, talk about some alternative methods for running HWORF, and um, see if we can get rid of this, and uh, so there are several useful things that you can do with these alternative methods, although it's not uh, not advisable to use these for running HWORF in general, um, but when you are debugging, it is, uh, it's, a good, it's a good idea to have in the back of your head that you don't have to run all of these in the normal Rakodo type of way. Uh, I want to cover some interactive batch jobs and wrapper options with you guys, and then um, running the EX script straight from the shell, and um, then manually running HWORF Python functions, which is also an option. So, uh, like we've mentioned several other times today, 
Uh, you have several ways to run automation systems, including EC Flow and Rakodo. You can run with wrappers, uh, like we do for the public release. Interactive batch jobs uh, make things a bit easier for manually submitting the scripts and the functions. So uh, when you're running more than a few cycles of HWARF, definitely use the automation. Uh, but when you're implementing new capabilities, you uh, probably want to just uh, submit these directly and see what the immediate uh, result is. Maybe you have some syntax errors or whatever. Um, so you don't really want to be waiting forever on a batch job to tell you that um, you messed something up in line two, uh, which I've done plenty of times. So um, then DTC already supports the wrappers like we mentioned before uh, for any of, the, any of the components that are supported in the public release. Uh, you can use those as uh, as templates really for submitting the other jobs, um, but some of them are already there, so there is no need to uh, reconstruct the wheel. And it allows you to really uh, submit one component at a time. Although I do want to mention that you can't start from the middle of a run. Um, if you just stage data on the on disk, it's very difficult uh, with the database that Sam just um, outlined to really start in the middle. You can definitely hack the database if you feel comfortable doing that, saying that you know all of these files are available, but um, the availability gets set in the database as the tasks run, so um, it won't be set if you're trying to just stage data and then run from the middle. Um, then, uh, again, manual execution is ideal for a quick turnaround when you're debugging. Um, so to run with the HWARF wrappers, uh, there are all of these wrappers that exist and are supported in the wrappers directory. And uh, so you can see this is not an extensive list of all the things that run. Um, for instance, we don't have one for the input job or um, various other jobs. There are plenty of jobs that run that uh, we're not uh, reflecting here, and that's because a lot of those are um, are specific to known machines, which uh, most of the community doesn't really have access to. So um, these are these are a subset. Um, but again, you can use them as a template. Uh, in order to run with the wrappers, there is one file called global bars dot sh. Uh, I apologize that it is not named ksh. Um, so each each of these uh, sources the global bar each of the wrappers sources the global bars file to start with, so that it sets a few of these environment variables that we need, such as the start time, so the cycle that you're running, uh, the storm ID, and we're also setting that we're running in history mode. Uh, we also need to set the home HWARF path, so that's uh, the same as it is in the rest of the system. It is the path to the HWARF installation that you have on your computer. The experiment just needs to be that um, that last directory that, that uh, you've named your installation. And then um, there's also a start file here that is named, and we put a start file in the wrappers directory that includes uh, several environment variables, one of which is the um, directory that the configuration, the launcher, uh, sets up for that holdvars.txt file. That's important because then we don't need to know that whole path each time. We can source the start file and have that information available to us. So uh, the wrappers mean that you are uh, you are the one in charge of dependencies. So these must be submitted in sequence. You have to know mm -hmm. what be completed um, before the next. Uh, one. Excuse me. Can you mute your mute your uh, phones, please? Okay. 
Um, so some of the wrappers can be submitted simultaneously, but others do require the completion of the previous task completely before uh, submission. So in this case, uh, anything in a vertical uh, format can be submitted simultaneously. They don't have any dependencies on each other. So the launcher has to be run first, it completes, and then you can run all of the initialization and buffer prep uh, wrappers. All of them need to complete, before, except for maybe buffer prep, before um, running relocate. Once relocate completes, then you can run uh, GSI on domains two and three. Those have to complete uh, before you run merge, then unpost. Uh, then you can run forecast post and products all together, but it is important to note that you don't want to submit your post and products jobs until the forecast is in the running state so that um, you're not wasting compute time with the post and products if the forecast isn't actually running yet. And it can take quite a while sometimes for the, the forecast job to actually start running after it's been submitted to the queue. So these are just a few things to keep in mind as you're submitting these. So again, just to point out that you are the keeper of the dependencies when you're running uh, the wrapper. So you also need to uh, set uh, submission information. Um, so these QSub scripts are not something that we provide necessarily, but uh, you can create them based on the information that's available in the ENT files for Recodo. So um, each of the, the systems that we run on with uh, the NOAA research uh, has the has this information included in the ENT files for Recodo. So um, it just is set up in a slightly different way when you submit it with a, an SH script. Uh, so what we do here is set all of the batch system uh, requirements. Uh, we move into the PBSO work directory and that just is the directory uh, that you submit the job from on the front end node uh, by default and then run the wrapper. And then the wrapper is the thing that is going to set all of the environment variables you need in order to run the script. So um, it's important to keep in mind that those wrappers are serving the purpose of just exporting any required variables before it runs the script in the, the EX HWRF scripting layer of, of HWRF. So um, you can run the EX scripts manually. Uh, you don't need one of these wrappers in order to run and there is de more detailed information on the Doxygen webpage that we've been referencing today. Um, there are some pros, uh, we've talked about many of those, uh, can potentially save a whole lot of time waiting, um, even if there is some spin up time getting it running to start with. Uh, some cons, it does require all the prior jobs to be run beforehand so that there's a database availability of those products uh, from previous jobs. And um, you can do that with the automation system and then switch into submitting these jobs uh, manually at some desired point in the middle. Uh, for some, for some uh, of, the, of the tasks you will need to create your own wrapper so uh, you can use the ones that exist as templates. Uh, there's information on what environment variables are needed by each of the scripts in both the Doxygen documentation and in the Recodo ENT files uh, and then you just load that that holdbars.txt file that's written by the launcher and um, submit the script. It is important to know that each job has different requirements for using this method and I will go through some of those now. So uh, for running the launcher script exhwerf underscore launch.py uh, there are directions included in the Dox Doxygen web page for creating your own script to run the launcher manually. However, I suggest not doing that given that launcher wrapper already exists in the wrapper subdirectory. Um, and to be honest, I always run the launcher on a front end node. Um, it can be run as a, a 
a batch job, but it's uh, it's there and available, and there is no need to recreate the wheel on that one. So um, it's pretty straightforward. This script must be run in order to set the configuration because you'll need that in order to run any of the, the subsequent uh, steps. And um, anytime you rerun the launcher, it's going to uh, reset or change the configuration files. Uh, sorry, the storm1.com configuration files used by all the HWARF components. So if you change anything directly in storm1.com, that will get overwritten to whatever your configuration files in PARM are, are setting, um, or your command line arguments. So uh, the, the good thing about the wrapper is that it does create a start file to make the loading of the required environment variables easier, and I'm, um, I'm going to do something slightly different than was done on the Oxygen web page, and I'm going to source that uh, start file directly instead of so sourcing um, the hold bars first. With the, with the entire path. Uh, I'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, Launcher was easy to run on a front-end node. It doesn't take many resources. It runs rather quickly. Um, but the other larger jobs, and especially the, the MPI jobs, um, you really can't run those on a front-end node. You shouldn't, even if you could try to get it through. Um, so, uh, you can submit the scripts and then just control C out before you actually get to the, the running of the executable. Um, or you can run it in an interactive batch session. So, um, like I mentioned, the, the larger serial jobs can technically run on the front end nodes, but just you shouldn't do that. Um, and then, uh, so the, the OpenMP jobs, the or the jobs that require environment variable total task to be set. Um, you can do it in one of two ways. Like I mentioned, uh, you're either going to uh, just check the script for setting up the, the working directory and everything, but not submit the job. So in this case, you would set total task equal to 1, whereas it might be set to 24, 48, or whatever. Uh, by the HWARF system by default, and then just exit the script uh, before you run the forecast or whatever component it is you're trying to run. Um, if you wanted to just check the forecast uh, or that whatever executable you're running, you need to submit it to an interactive session uh, in order to actually run an MPI task. So. Um, in that interactive session, you would actually have requested a total number of processors that can uh, fit your job, but you have access to submit that um, submit that script to that job uh, and get an immediate feedback uh, for for your debugging process. So, in order to start an interactive session on Jet, uh, you can use the I, and if necessary, probably not necessary, not necessary the X. Uh, commands in order to do that, and um, these options just open your uh, interactive session for you, and then you have to include any of the other options that you want for that particular session. So uh, once you QSub with all these options, you just wait for the request to be granted. This is essentially waiting in the queue like you would for any other um, any other script to run, but this time you're going to actually get a, a prompt back and be able to submit things in the uh, in the command line on a compute node. So um, an example for opening up one of these interactive sessions for the forecast job, if we wanted to use uh, 1,234 processors for the forecast, uh, we could submit here to UJet on the batch uh, queue with that many processors. Uh, we think that we only need about six hours of wall time for this job and uh, we'll need 40 gigabytes of memory. I just got this information from uh, either a wrapper or a, uh, a Rakodo ENT file. So uh, once you've chosen how it is you want to submit your, your uh, script, 
then you just move into the scripts directory, uh, you source your start file from the wrappers directory, um, and then you can source your uh, holdbars uh, file that's in the com hwerf. So by sourcing the start file, we have the directory uh, to the com. So we can actually use those environment variables now. We set the total task. Here, either it's going to be one if we decided to check the script on the front end node, or 1,234 if we're using our interactive session. And then uh, we just run the script with our exhwerf, which is also included in the, in the start file, or the hold bars. Um, I wanted to mention a few special jobs that require extra environment variables. The init and BDY jobs are special in that the the um, those scripts take extra environment variables. Init is going to be run several different times for uh, GFS init and all three FGAT hours for the GDAS init. So um, those are handled through the init model, init F hour, and init parts. Uh, environment variables, the model is going to set GDAS or GFS. The init F hour is going to set whether it's the analysis for GFS or the 369 hour forecast for the GDAS uh, first guess. And then uh, init parts is going to tell us what, what part of the initialization we need to do. Uh, 3D var is just going to process everything needed for relocation. BDY does the full boundary conditions for uh, the full length of the forecast. Parent is only going to do the bare minimum required for no initialization forecast. And then all is going to be the kitchen sink. So everything that we can run for initialization will be run. Um, and that will, uh, that will give us um, all of these together. So uh, the wrappers are set, I believe, to run uh, all for these instead of splitting boundary conditions out from uh, 3D bar. But uh, that's something that you can set manually in those wrappers if you like. Um, a few important things to mention about the archiving and input jobs, if those are the ones you're working on, you must run those on a node with HPSS access um, and also with sufficient memory. So um, that's important. Uh, something I didn't mention here, but not only do you need HPSS, HPSS access, but the account that you're running from also needs RST prod access. Um, so uh, those are all requirements for running these jobs. And on NOAA machines, the front end nodes, and several of the queues will all do this for you. So um, any of these are options for running those jobs. So if you want to build your own wrapper script, uh, you can do that. Um, like I said earlier, you need to run the launcher first. Uh, go ahead and use the wrapper that is included there and put any of your configuration edits you need into it. Um, no need to recreate that. Um, use the start file that the wrapper creates in the wrappers directory and the storm one that whole bars that txt in the com directory uh, so that you can load the required envir environment variable so that it makes your life a little easier. And then um, after you decide whether you want to submit on a front end node, not running the MPI executables or in an interactive session, um, you can uh, set that up and then export any of the additional uh, variables that you need for the specific file. Um, and then you submit your script and you're good to go and uh, wait for uh, any of your your errors to potentially pop up or uh, get a, a nice clean uh, clean submission of the script and success. Uh, if you don't want to do all of that and you want to just run the Python functions themselves, you can also do that. So this is one step further. We're not uh, worrying about using the scripts level even. We're just submitting uh, directly the one Python function at a time. 
So uh, in order to do this, you will need an interactive session. Um, you'll want to run the launcher again so that we can uh, get all of the configuration and, and directory structure set up, and then start a Python shell. And to do that, um, again, we're, we're uh, sourcing our start file and our holdbars.txt. Uh, we want the Python path to point toward the, the HWARF installation of Python and uh, just set total task to one for this process uh, and uh, launch Python. So uh, two things that you'll need to do before you launch any of the rest of uh, the HWARF modules is uh, initialize the ProjUtil package with an import ProjUtil.setup and initialize the HWARF EXPT module. Once you do this, anything available to HWARF is available for you to run in this Python session. Um, so an example to get the name of the MOAD domain, you can do much more uh, in-depth stuff here, but uh, once you've uh, imported those two modules, you can, you can say, all right, I just want to print the string uh, HWARF EXPT.MOAD, and it prints whatever MOAD is. Um, set to, and in this case it is named MOAD, so you would get um, that output to the screen. Uh, Sam mentions on the website that conceivably the entire HWARF system could be run this way in a single Python interactive session. Um, I don't think that I would, I would recommend that for anybody, really. Um, it can be quite tedious and there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on, but uh, technically, you could do it if that's what you wanted to spend your time doing. Uh oh. Um, and apparently, that's all all I had for you guys in this uh, talk. Is there any any uh, any questions from anybody? No. All right. Um, so, hey, hey, Christina, this is Gus. Quick question. Um, this recording will be able to distribute this uh, later on, right? There, there um, are a few folks who couldn't who couldn't make it today who we probably sure. want them to see this. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, as far as if you can give me the files, I can post them with you know with the with the presentations on the website. Okay. Awesome. We can talk offline about that. Just wanted. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So it's pretty rare that we finish things five minutes early, um, consistently, <laughs> uh, but uh, that's fine by me. Um, so on the schedule we have us starting at 3.30 and I don't know that uh, we really want to bump that up too much. Um, so I guess we can, we can come back in 35 minutes and uh, get started on being able to create a new job in HWARF. So, um, We'll stop the recording now, or if it's already stopped, um, that's fine. And then, uh, Gus, can you fire up the, the telecon maybe five minutes beforehand? Sure, no problem. Uh, yeah, start, start up the recording back uh, five minutes before, you said? Uh, maybe not necessarily the recording, but the, the meeting. Okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah, okay, excellent. Thank you. I will go ahead and start presenting. Uh, I've asked Sam to pop in with any additional comments or remarks while I'm talking, or um, any of you really can feel free to interrupt me to stop me to ask me to go slower or um, do something differently or make suggestions, uh, anything that you find would be helpful in understanding what's going on. So, uh, like I said, feel absolutely free to do any of that. Um, let's see. So in this session, I do have some slides to kind of uh, uh, usher us along in the, the process, but uh, for the most part, I just want out I will be going back and forth between those slides and the 
sorry, those slides and uh, my terminal window so that you can see what I'm doing and uh, as I'm explaining why I'm doing it. Uh, I did not open up this adding a component thing. Um, sorry about that. Okay. So uh, this afternoon we have uh, this exercise and I wanted to just outline a couple of the goals of the exercise. Uh, we got some feedback that it would be helpful for people to understand how to add a workflow component and since that can be uh, interpreted in many different ways, uh, I made an exercise in which we are just working with the scripts layer and the Rakodo uh, layer to be able to add a workflow component. We did this for a few different reasons and that was so that we could understand the interaction between the scripts and Rakodo workflow manager a little bit more uh, and also consider dependency changes that are necessary for adding a new component um, and to demonstrate the basics. But I was trying to stay away from uh, actually creating a new HWORF component for this thing. We have, that's a pretty big undertaking for, uh, you know, and it's a, you know, research development, so didn't really want to go that far. Um, or to make things overly complicated. We can approach uh, the possibility of having more in-depth stages to this process. If uh, people wanted something different from it, we can get feedback and, and find out what might be more helpful, but this is our first stab at uh, talking about adding that workflow component um, without doing too much actual HWORF development. So we will be uh, utilizing things that already exist um, quite a bit in today's exercise and just uh, talking about those interactions a little bit more with hands-on experience. So there's a whole list of things that you need to consider anytime you're thinking about adding a task to the HWORF workflow. Um, the first that pops into my head is how much Python scripting is needed for your workflow addition. And when I say Python scripting, I mean does it need its own set of utili utilization scripts in the USH? Uh, do you need any additional prod utils functionality? Because we don't want to just use um, basic uh, command line, uh, you know, like ls minus l. Sam went through this whole huge list of things that he's added to the prod utils package earlier, um, and those are there as they were needed. So there's a possibility that a new workflow uh, component would need even more functionality there, even though so much already exists. Um, in general, through the whole system, what can you leverage from what already exists and um, not re recreating any wheels in uh, 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 that entire system, really? So it's, uh, that one's a big question. How does it change, uh, how does your addition change the data input and output of other tasks? So it's not just dependencies at the Rakoto level, but really dependencies at the the uh, experiment definition level too. So how are you going to need to change HWORF exp.py, um, which I covered in the next bullet as well. And then uh, does it need any configuration options? Does it need any uh, additional sections or just a new variable in an already existing section? Um, and that's, that's uh, something you should always ask yourself as you're adding things to HWORF, whether it's a new component or task or whatever. Um, and does the thing that you want to add to HWARF need a switch to be able to turn it on and off? And I can tell you right now that the answer is almost always yes when we're talking about HWARF. So being able to choose that as an option or not um, is pretty important. I do have this wonderful slide that tells you so much. Um, you are not alone when you're answering all of these millions of questions about what happens when you're adding this, this uh, component that you're considering. So just come to the HWARF Developers Committee. Uh, you don't have to actually come to the meetings. You can email us or, or contact us otherwise. But uh, let us know your idea. 
your concerns, your questions about adding, um, adding your development, and we will help you in any way that we can, whether that's directly or getting you in contact with the people who can help you. Continuing to ask questions and stay curious is a wonderful um, way to get your developments into the trunk. So don't forget that um, even though this feels overwhelming, we can definitely help you with your individual uh, needs and questions. So I'll stop with that. You're not alone. We'll help. Um, so today's task, uh, I am including this guy one more time. Um, we are adding a workflow component to the um, to the the products se uh, section and task. Um, we're not really adding any new capabilities. Basically what we're doing here is pulling the NHC products uh, function out of the current products task and giving it its own function. Um, so again, we're not adding anything below the scripts layer necessarily or even changing anything at the uh, experiment layer, but we are going to be adding scripts and photo uh, ENT files. Uh, since this only touches uh, post forecast things, uh, I turned off most of the initialization stuff that happens for H work. Uh, this is probably not entirely necessary, but we're not touching any of this. It seemed like a waste to have you all use your resources to run them. So um, the configuration I gave you and the branch turned off um, turned off relocation, GSI, which turned off all of these tasks. Um, and then uh, I also turned off the ocean so that we didn't have to run ocean initialization. No ensemble DA uh, was run for this one either. So it's basically just initialize with GFS. Um, this one also didn't run, so it's just straight from initialize from GFS into check init. Um, and then run the uncoupled forecast. And then I had it stop before we run the products because we don't actually want to run the products. We want to run a new set of tasks after we run post. So that should be where um, your run stopped running if you ran it. And it is where I believe my run stopped running when I did run it. So if anybody saw anything different from that, please let me know. So um, I like to think about this in terms of ingredients, like we were uh, starting from a recipe to bake something. But um, here is the, the flow diagram from the very first talk that I gave this morning, talking about all the different layers and what layers are affected. So since we're only working with HWORK components that are, are already there, and run by default, we don't really need to define them in the layers below the experiment layer. So we have all of the prod utils available that we need. We have all of the implementation available that we need, and everything is already set up in the experiment level. So we're really just running scripts in Rakoto um, scripts for this task. So um, all of that is included in this in a single script product exhworf underscore products.py and it submits it as one batch job in the Rakoto workflow and that single job handles all of the work. Uh, so in my head the simple way to accomplish this goal of uh, breaking out the NHC products is to create two uh, scripts and have uh, a Rakoto job submit them individually instead of um, instead of some of the alternatives, and definitely instead of having one job and one script. So um, I decided that there would be one for NHC products and one for all of the other products. There can be many other solutions to the same problem. Uh, one that came up in our discussions for planning this exercise was that um, we could set it up like the init job, where we have the same script that's called multiple times from different Rakoto jobs with different arguments or environment variables that specify which sets of tasks to run. So that moves um, the, the, the logic for whether it's going to run or not to, uh, or how it's going to run to a different 
layer. So that that logic is in the scripts versus um, with the user or to run by default. Um, in that configuration, you also have options to make it configurable so that you can either decide to run it as one batch job or to run them separately. Um, but for today's task, we only have so much time, and um, I just wanted to show you how to break them apart into two jobs. So that's what we're going to focus on uh, today. So uh, as far as the scripts go, we have the products, and um, I want to work on creating two new scripts. So if we get out of this, uh, this PowerPoint, uh, we can walk through the creation of those scripts in, um, in the branch that I gave you guys. Can you all see my terminal? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I am looking in, trying to look in um, my CP Python training directory where I've checked out the training branch that I emailed you all. So if I do a, an SPN info, you can see that that's um, the CP Python training branch. Um, so we want to change directories into the scripts area. Um, if you're following along, you can feel free to do this with me. If I'm going too quickly, then please stop me um, and I will uh, repeat anything or uh, answer any other clarification questions. So if we open up the uh, products.py script uh, and just kind of scroll through a little bit, we can see that we, like we've mentioned many times today, we are uh, importing the expt module, which is very important for running, as well as a bunch of the uh, prod utils, but most importantly, the prod util that set up uh, uh, module, um, and then several others that we need for this particular uh, set of jobs. We define several functions, including gripper, tracker, and copier, then products. Products is the one that we're looking for here. Um, it is what runs the NHC suite of products, um, and it does that on multiple threads. So um, we also have wave posts now. That's relatively new. wasn't in here as of a few weeks ago. Um, starter is going to be the main program for the subprocesses. Uh, and then it calls several other things like the tracker, the copier, the gripper um, on multiple different ranks. So this is a moderately complex bit of code in here for starters as far as uh, parallel codes go. Um, we have the slave main uh, function and <laughs> sorry guys, um, the slave main function here that um, is running all of our processes in pro parallel as well. It's just, again, another layer to that parallel function stuff. Um, so um, the, my goodness, <laughs> sorry about that, guys. Um, so uh, we have a launch self, which helps us again with the NPI, and then a function uh, do it, which actually uh, is running everything. Um, and that sets up our logger warnings, uh, runs launch self, uh, it runs products, and the wave posts. Uh, and then uh, our last line is what actually starts with the do it function. Then, um, then what we want to do here is just take out any of the stuff that is uh, related to the NHC products. So that uh, includes the do it 
section, uh, one line here, or this whole grouping of lines that says uh, that if we have a 126 hour forecast, we're going to run products. Um, I'm not entirely sure that this is necessary, but I'm not sure exactly what you're getting if uh, you're not running a 126 hour uh, process, but it does work um, without, without this requirement. So uh, we want to break that out and put it into a different uh, script. And we also want that function uh, products that we defined up at the top to be in that additional script as well. So uh, what I've done is I've uh, prepared those scripts here for you. But you can see that if I uh, open up uh, Hmm. Ah, they're all starting with EXHTOR. Uh, NHC.py, um, I've pulled out only those things related to running the products uh, function. So we still have do it defined, but here we're only, uh, we're only using the init module, uh, the project util setup as always, and uh, we're starting a logger for uh, now EXHWRF NHC. And uh, so then we want to, to set the variables for the products, add the alerts and deliveries, and run the products function, which is defined above. Um, honestly, I just copy pasted all of these things from uh, the, the original product script, put them here, and um, and they're all available to run as a separate script now. Uh, this is what I meant earlier by not recreating the wheel. Uh, Sam may have comments on doing this in a more elegant way. But this is uh, where, where I went with this process. Um, I left uh, one other script. Uh, it's new. Um, I named it prods because it's a shortened version of products um, in, in my head that worked. So now EXH for prods has all of the things that Christina, the products. Christina, could I make a comment? Could I make a comment? Yes. Make it work make before it, you make it pretty. Make it pretty. Okay. So <laughs> Making it work is usually where I stop, um, which is probably bad. But so this <laughs> this works. Um, but I did break out all of the things that I had in um, the products into just a prods.py, and none of it included the NHC products. So that's what is um, here. Notice when I get down to the bottom of this file where there was previously um, previously running products in this general area, I've taken that out. So, um, so we do have two separate scripts that uh, were all included in one script before. OK. Does anybody have any questions about this script generation step that I just went through? Or any other comments, even? Excellent. Um, I'm just going to look here and see, do we have any people who we have muted indefinitely without? OK. All right. Um, I also don't have the chat open. OK. Do you want me to know? So, All right, Christina. All right, Christina. Uh -huh. Do you want me to turn on the mute them? Um, that may be good for the session, just so people can stop me um, whenever they need to. Um, and if they get too loud, then we can mute them again. All right, sounds good. All right, sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, OK, so going back to the PowerPoint slides now, um, we've gone through the scripts generation, and this just outlines what I've just done. 
um, separating the two into two uh, explicit scripts at the scripts level. Now um, we need to create uh, job submission files for these two scripts that um, don't already exist because Rakoto is set up to submit that products uh, script, not these two new ones. So in order to do that, we can use the old products ENT file in a similar way that we just use the old product script um, and set up two new ENT files. So here I'm changing directories into uh, the Rakoto tasks area. Um, and in here we have all of the tasks available to use, but we want to be uh, focused on our products. Um, so here we have a products.ent and we can open that up and see what it looks like on the inside. And like I mentioned earlier in the Rakoto talk, we have a task name with all of our job submission uh, variables uh, included at the top where we're setting um, our ranks, our threads, our um, the name of uh, our output log. Here they are joined into uh, just a, a dot log file instead of a dot out and dot air file. Um, we set our wall time and uh, many of the other things that we have to set in each job submission. Then we export uh, or excuse me, set several different variables that are used for uh, Rakoto in, in this chunk here and set our dependencies. This is, um, this is my doing, uh, not how it is by default in the trunk. This task dependency was set so that it would never be met um, and never run for you guys when you're running the preparation activity. So this is not the one that we would like to use here. Um, typically, the product's job depends on the post job finishing. So once the post job has finished, um, products runs. Uh, it also is fine if the post job is in the state running. So um, we can definitely uh, use that to our advantage here as we're talking about the shortened prods job and then the NHC products. Um, so uh, let's see. Again here I have already done this activity for you guys. I've included um, the ENT file, so it's basically a copy of um, products.ent, but this is prods.ent, staying consistent with the scripts file that I named earlier. We have all of the same things uh, with a few noted exceptions. The task name no longer reflects that it's products, but now it's prods to be more consistent with the naming of the files. Um, so I've changed that here. I've changed the script name that we're submitting because we no longer want to submit products as it was before. Um, and the job name also needed that reflection. So basically I found every instance of products in this file and changed it to prods. Um, and uh, kept the job ranks the same because um, Honestly, because I wasn't sure which ones I'd need for which task and which ones I wouldn't, so I left them all. Um, and as Sam says, get it working before you clean it up. So I left them. Um, I left it at the post wall time. I assumed that um, it would need just as much time as it always does. This is kind of, um, uh, it depends on how long it takes to run the forecast because it can run at the same time as the forecast and it'll wait on those products to be delivered so changing this doesn't really um, need to happen even though it may take less time to run um, if you're running it on uh, post files that already exist. Uh, I didn't change anything in the, the environment variables section uh, but I did go back to these test dependencies here 
um, as they are in the trunk. So um, now this products, uh, this shortened products job is going to depend on the post either in state running or completed. So um, it can run simultaneously or after post is done successfully. And um, that's all we need. So um, one other uh, script to go. I have also included the NHC ENT files. Again, I went through everywhere in the products um, in the products ENT file that had the word products, and I changed it to EN NHC to reflect the changes I made in the scripts level. So now we are running the uh, the NHC script here. We're naming the job NHC and um, keeping all of these environment variables the same as they were in the uh, products job originally. Uh, I didn't change the post wall time here either, although this one may be able to change depending on what um, on the dependencies that we're setting. Uh, SAN may be able to add a little bit more information here. If we're running just the NHC product SAN, um, do we need that to be as long as the as the forecast time, or no? Actually, if you give it multiple threads, then it can run under a thirty second. Okay, so this just runs once products uh, the shortened products has completed. Is that true? It doesn't need to run in time. Mm -hmm. Uh, simultaneously. The NHC products program can run once the work flag files and track files are available. Okay. So uh, Sam just told us a couple of dependencies that are not um, what I'm reflecting here necessarily. Um, what I've put here is that my shortened products uh, uh, task has completed. So that does indeed cover the two things that he mentions, but it covers it in a way um, that may not be entirely appropriate for operations. Um, once the product's job finishes, this will run, it'll be fine, but um, you may not have that time to, to waste in operations. So um, you could also change this task dependency uh, to be a file dependency instead. So once those files are written to their appropriate locations, they're old enough, then you can um, you can use a data dependency here instead. Is that true, Sam? Going to take that as yes. Okay. Um, so you just could think use about a the data, data dependency, dependency, or you could just use your current use dependency your current and add a dependency, add a dependency on the forecast. Doesn't your pod job output the track? Output the track? Mm -hmm. Then yes. the only other data, data dependency is the forecast output. output. So you just need to add a dependency to the forecast job. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, so this would be. I could even add it here so I can show you what I'm talking about. Um, you can either say. Uh, the task dependency that prods is finished um, or the task dependency that the forecast And the data dependency, is that what we said? Data dependency on something. Sam? 
No, the and goes on the outermost part of the... Sorry, I'm getting a really bad echo. Hard to talk. Hard to talk. Oh. Uh, you would have an outermost and dependency. The first element of the and would be the pod half-step. And then the second one would just be the ampersand forecast complete semicolon. Wait, prods and? Can you repeat that? Prods and? Sam, can you see this? Thank you. <sighs> okay. <laughs> so, prods. And forecast complete? Yes. 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 Okay. Fantastic. All of this is not going to work. Here? No. All right. Got that worked out. So we have a couple different things um, that you need to get rid of your and uh, your task that OSP. Here. This impact. This impact. What? What? No. All right. Okay. So we have these two anti files. Let's break you out of this email situation. Sam, I don't understand where the and goes. <laughs> Forecast complete is a complex dependency in Rokoto slash depth slash forecast complete dot ENT. I'm going to have to hang up and call back in because I have an echo so bad I can't hear myself think. Okay. I'm curious if this echo is coming from me using a computer and not a phone. Does anybody have any information about whether that's a possibility? All right. Um, is everybody hearing the echo except for me? Yeah, we can hear yeah, the echo. Can hear oh, okay. Let's see. It only happens when I'm talking. I can hear my echo. Um, let me see if I can actually call in from uh, from a landline and get rid of the echo. This is 
um, it's more useful if we are um, all able to hear each other. So, um, is there an 800 number by any chance for this? Nope. Um, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, this is uh, taking just a second. We're waiting for Sam to come back. Anyways. Sam is back. Sam is back. Hi, Sam. Do you still have an echo? Yes. Yes. All right. Um, let me let me try to fix the echo on my end and call in from a phone instead of my computer. Um. I'm going to mute myself. Sam, if you'd like to talk about this for just a second. You guys all hear me at this point? Yeah, we can hear. Oh, you have an echo. Okay, yeah, yeah. now there's a mild on. echo. Do I have an echo? Uh, I don't hear an echo from you. I haven't though all day, which is why I was suspecting it was me. Um, maybe this will help a little bit. So, all right, getting back here to the dependency. Um, so Sam, I have this and statement. You said the forecast complete was a complex um, a complex dependency that is in the in um, the depth. It's defined in the depth uh, subdirectory of Ricodo and uh, it is and either the task dependency or the forecast complete dependency. Net. Is that true? We don't need both. No, the, the end. The end block has to. Sorry, now it's right. Yes. Unless there's a typo or not noticing, it should be right now. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Um, I just want to show people what we're talking about real quick. If we look in this forecast complete, it's defined um, in the dependencies directory up one level and um, forecast complete here is going to list several different uh, options for forecast actually being complete. So it says that either the coupled forecast is complete, uh, the uncoupled forecast is complete, or uh, the wave watch three ocean task is complete. So either of, uh, any of those three task being completed means that the forecast is indeed complete and um, we just don't need to include all five of these lines in every uh, ENT file that we're we're using so that's uh, that's this that's this uh, line that we just put here in the dependency of nhc.py so that we're saying we want both the product uh, dependency to be complete and the forecast to be complete before we actually run uh, this NHC product. Um, all right. So I think we're on track here to be able to um, talk about the next step that has to be done. So uh, this is just a, a technicality type thing uh, so that we can refer to NHC uh, products as jobs uh, separate from each other in the workflow, we have this all.ent file here um, that sets a whole lot of different entities and it just names each of these ENT files from saying uh, task. So uh, the merge ENT file here uh, is being referred to as the merge task in 
the WORF, uh, the HWORF Ricodo template. That gets defined in this all.ent file. This is a list of all possible ENT files and the names that we're giving them. So um, here, if we want to also define, um, we can either take this out or I believe we can just add uh, two more lines if we want to do it that way. Uh, we want prod, and I want to keep it pretty. And then we also want NHC because we made that one. So here, um, instead of doing the product and the prod NHC, we um, have these two. I can take products out since we don't want to run that at all anymore. So I've just changed one line to two now, just like I've done with every other thing um, so far. And that was the all.ent file. Um, before we get going too far into this, I want to make sure that I actually stop this um, from running since I'm changing things that will change uh, the dependencies on Rakoto. I want to make sure that I'm changing, that I'm not running it uh, continuously in the background. Um, so the next thing we've added script and um, we've added our Rakoto ENT files for submitting the new script and now we just need to put it in the workflow. If we don't actually put it in the workflow, even though we have those um, submission scripts uh, .ent files, then it won't ever run. So in the, the Rakoto workflow we have here, um, we can open that up and take a look and see that the product uh, that we just erased, the product task that we took out of the all.ent file uh, is being referenced here. Um, it's, it's being referenced here um, because it was defined in the all.ent file. And um, since we don't have this anymore, we can change the both product prods and NHC like we've done for everything else. So if we want to take a look at all of the things that we've done to this uh, directory so far, um, we could do an SDN diff of the task um, and it would tell us, uh, I changed the dependencies from the task dependency that was uh, in the um, in this uh, this branch, uh, I changed the entities in the all.ent as well. And then uh, I also added that pod.ent, uh, but that is also in the branch. It would not be in the trunk. Okay, so everything is there. We should be able to run this um, if we submitted our workflow again. So. Uh, we can do it that way by submitting that flash run H work. Um, but we don't know if that is going to take forever in the queue or not. Um, we can at least submit it and see if uh, we got all of our Rakoto stuff working correctly. Um, so this is just me submitting the task that I already did that ran up to the point products would not run because I set that dependency um, in, in a way that would never be met. Um, so if I submit this one more time with the dash F option, mm. I'm hoping that we don't get any failures. But this will catch any syntax errors in um, the Rakoto script that I may have made. Um, so it seems that that is not the case. Um, even through all of the, the stuff that uh, we went through with the dependencies, if that had been a problem, we wouldn't have made it this far in the Rakoto submission. So what this is telling me is that we were able to submit the um, H4 prod uh, uh, job and uh, successfully. 
So this should be in the queue now. If we did a queue sub um, minus u, I'm running under DTC. Nope, no, 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 no. Queue stat, sorry about that. Um, and we have uh, a products job running uh, or in the state queue uh, for the moment. So this could take a while. Um, my forecast has already run. It's only 12 hours, so it may not take very long, but we could uh, definitely um, wait on this to continue, uh, answer any questions uh, at the moment, and um, talk about any of the steps that we did to get to this point. Um, because there is a dependency on uh, this product finishing before we can run the uh, the, the NHC products. Um, I don't know what else we can do, but we do need to eventually check that the NHC products also are acceptable um, if, in terms of syntax and that kind of thing. Um, so are there any questions? Sam, do you have any additional comments? Looks good to me so far. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, I do want to go back here to the slides. Just mention again um, what we've done here. It kind of changed the, the workflow so uh, that it looks like products. Uh, originally, it looked like products going to output, um, and now instead, products going to NHC going to output. Um, and uh, that brings me to one other thing. We need to consider the dependencies. Um, this guy is running here, and that's fine, but let's see if we're still in the queue. Um, so, uh, we do need to make sure that the output now reflects the appropriate uh, dependencies as well. So that is something that we did not necessarily cover. So we go into the task directory and look at the output.ent. Uh, we can see here that uh, we have a post complete dependency on the output. Um, we need to consider whether this is appropriate or not for NHC. So, um, Sam, off the top of your head, can you tell me what output does? You mean the, the H4 output job? Yes. Copies a ton of things to the com directory. A ton of things. Okay. So, um, it seems that if it's just looking for post being complete, that it doesn't matter if product is complete or not. It needs all true? of them. It needs products to be complete as well? Yes. If the dependency looks like that in the trunk, then that's a bug we have to fix. Oh, excellent. Um, I don't think I did anything to this. Um, so... Um, in that case, we would also need posts to be complete, products to be, or prods to be complete. Oh, all right. And Hold on. Post complete is not testing the post jobs completion. That is a complex dependency in the rogue kodo slash depths directory. And okay. it waits I for the products job, the post or post helper, and there's some other dependencies for ocean coupling. Okay. So you actually need to go to that file and replace the products completion with your two new jobs. Okay. So I'm currently in that file. Um, I've opened up uh, dependencies, uh, the depth post complete file. And here we have the products dependency. We also want to change this to prize and NHC. 
Um, I don't typically recommend doing this while something is running, but we are waiting on that to run and not changing this set of dependencies anyway. So, um, so um, now that we have those two dependencies in the post complete ENT file, uh, we should be able to get all the way through our workflow um, in the same way that we would have before. So uh, instead of going from products to output, where output is checking the forecast, the post or post helper and the product, um, it is now checking uh, that Probs is probably redundant in there, but it's checking that coupled forecast or uncoupled forecast, uh, post or post helper, prods and NHC have all completed. So we should be covered, although uh, NHC can't run until prods run, so it doesn't necessarily need to recheck prods. All right, um, let's go back and see where our We're still queued on the prod and have uh, set up all of the dependencies. Uh, we can um, go back up and do a queue stat. Uh, sorry, a Rakoto stat on our XML to see um, what's going on in there now. All right, so um, we are already reflecting because uh, I did run uh, run hwork.py once. Uh, it is reflecting that we changed products to prods and NHC, which is good. It also reflects that uh, we are submitting uh, or we're in the process of submitting prods. If I run this again, um, even though we're in the queued state, um, with the dash F option, it should update my status of my prod job to Q. Um, we can see that process. Uh, since I've run it again, we should also be able to see the change dependencies on um, on a couple of these jobs that we change the dependencies on. So here we can see. Indeed, uh, PROS is still queued. NHC is not prepared to run yet. All of the dependencies have not been met. Um, if we want to do a Rakoto check on that to see what those dependencies are, um, we can do that. If we give it all of the, the options that Rakoto check needs, including a specific cycle and a specific path, uh, here, we can see that the, the NHC product is uh, looking for prods E99 of that cycle to have succeeded, and that is not the case yet. It's in the state queued at this point, so the dependencies here have not been met. And if we wanted to look at the output that we also changed um, here, we can uh, do a, a photo check on that. So um, one thing I do want to note about doing a Rakoto check is that I'm pretty sure um, that this list of dependencies is going to stop once, once, once one dependency has not been met. So it may give you a whole list of things that have been met and then one that is not succeeded and that is all it takes to not uh, run this. So it just stops evaluating at that point. Um, but uh, in this case, PROS was the first thing we listed, so it's not succeeded, so we don't get any of the other lists. Eventually it will tell us um, all of the other things that need to have succeeded in order for this to run. Um, and if we do another Q step, it says we've completed and I have a hard time believing it. So at this point, we would look to see why that's the 
the case. The first place I go um, if something fails is my uh, work HWORF directory in uh, one of these logs, and it is going to be in the God's log, which is up here at the top. And usually going right to the bottom. Um, It says that all of these are not available, but I'm not seeing any failures necessarily. Maybe it did finish. Sorry, I'm trying to pick out just a, a job finish message at the end of here. Let's try this one more time. See what happens. All right, so there was a failure. Here it's telling us that when it ran Rakoto run, the cycle um, was in state failed. It ran for 28 seconds before it failed, and so it's resubmitting it because it did not have um, did not have uh, success, and it had multiple shots at trying to do uh, do this. So max tries was something more than one for this case. Uh, let's look back into the prod blog. Um, you guys are welcome to uh, search around in this uh, area as well. I'm in the DTC area with the CP Python training. All right. Um, if any of you are also trying to debug, were there things that you saw that maybe I could have done differently or any errors that you saw that I was doing or seeing any error uh, any error blocks in here? Sam? Looks like it did nothing because you had already run the regritters. Ah. So it looks like it didn't run the tracker either, which is strange. Yeah. It should have run the tracker. It should have. Um. Did you give it multiple MPI ranks? I did. Does it still launch itself using MPI serial? It may. <laughs> it should. Um, let's see. Um, So I'm opening up the, the script that I edited for um, running the gripper. Uh, 
sorry, everything but the NHD products. And so when it went to launch self, it did absolutely nothing. That's exciting. Launch self. Oh, no. Could you go back to the log? Yes, I can. So when it launched itself, the what? No, no, go back to the bottom of the log. Ah. So two eighteen. Immediately exited. There's probably something wrong with your job card. I don't think anything's wrong with the script. Okay. Let's see here. And if we go to um, if we go back into the Rokoto area, look at the path uh, prod ENT file on um, these things are all set up the same way that they were in product I believe um, let's see if we can one thing that might be is the piece that unlimits the memory there's, I think on Jet you need a line less than memory greater than less than slash memory greater than, which sets it to unlimited memory. Um, but that may be already inside one of those entities. I'm curious if this has some reason something to do with me running as the DTC account because if we go into uh, my account we see that the same script should have <laughs> I'm crossing my fingers real hard right now but uh, I'm pretty sure that mine succeeded just fine um, then there's probably some memory limit that's being set in the DTC account that's much lower than in your account and we have seen these types of issues with a DTC account before, so this is um, this is not entirely an issue. So if we go into Rakoto here, um, I was able to get to the completion. If we do a Rakoto stat. Um, for my first try. Um, so here uh, was <laughs> uh, a point where I was able to get through prods and submit NHC. Um, let's see what the result of that was. So, Sam, you're saying that I could put in um, a memory tag into. Well, it looks like that is not. Part. I'm looking in the products.ent and I don't see that. So apparently it's not necessary when you're running under most users. We are running this again, so we can see. Um, yeah, it failed again. All right, let's see. Uh, just one other thing, if I did anything differently for prod in here than I did. Um, than I did uh, in my working area. So there's different here between prods and uh, 
Um, anybody on the phone have any questions about things in general that we have been discussing? Maybe not so much this random failure um, that we're trying to work on now, but um, just in general, anything? Anything from all day? All right. Um, so I'm going to do this quickly uh, to see if there were differences in how I set this up. And there were not. Um, I was able to get through the prods.ent submission on my my account, uh, not the DTC account, apparently. Um, and uh, so this is something that I would uh, like for you guys to try if you're up for it, if you want to, uh, going through this process and submitting these uh, jobs to see if they work on your account. Um, like I said, worked on my account, uh, and we have seen issues with memory things on the DPC account before. So um, I would not... Uh, want to <laughs> these are more advanced fun features of H work that uh, I, I don't necessarily want to get into today, um, but we can discuss them if, uh, if if anybody thinks we need to. We, we don't want to try to debug here. it. We could try to debug it. I'm going to let you go with that. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, something that we've tried to debug several times in the past. So um, let's. Where do we start, Sam? The epilogue at the end of the script on Jotit contains the memory usage information. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very little memory used. It didn't do anything when we went to the launch cell. So that makes sense, right? Um, did you want to walk us through these there's, things on your There's another or? thing missing. Uh-oh. You're not sending a logger into check run, so we don't know if anything's going wrong while check run okay. is running. At the end of, oh, it, in the uh, launch self, Okay. There's a check run command which executes MPI serial. At the end of the commands, just before the last parentheses, add comma logger equals jlogger. That'll send log messages to the jlog file and also the main log for the job. I also suggest you try to get an interactive debug session. I do have an interactive debug session. And try right. to ru run the product's job from that. Oh, so what we're going to do first, because that's what I've been saying all day, is go into the script directory. Correct? Uh, yes. So we we want to run the script. We you need, need to, to set, set the Python path and the total tasks. Let me set that to seven. Um, I asked for eight processes. Is it okay to set it to seven here? If you have the extra trackers enabled, it looks like it needs 11. I don't think if you I have do. An... Okay. 
don't believe I do. Okay, so I set to seven um, and export Python path underscore path. No underscore. No underscore. This includes the USH, is that true? Yes. You have a space between Python path equals and the path. Okay. I think you misspelled path. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Um, okay. So uh, we're here and we want to submit exhworf prod.py. Is that true? Are we ready? Hopefully. Well, apparently, Python path is not set correctly. <laughs> All right. I think it's because you oh. you didn't set Python path to Python path. You you misspelled Python path. Again. Okay. So if you go to the other terminal, you set Python path instead of Python path. Ah. You are correct. Thank you. It takes a village sometimes. Huge village. We did not source the um, Are you ready, running the correct shell? Is it bash? Or, oh yeah, it has to be because export is working. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm going to hold far. Try again. Wait, you also need to set total tasks. I did that. Did I? Oh. I might just be too slow to see it. Also, my... Yay! Okay, so it was a whole bar that got us um, in the spelling of Python path. Um, so we are here and running... Disk IO error. I saw several disk IO errors. Are you past quota? I think I had this conversation error. last night. <laughs> well, it, either your past quota or pan two has really big issues right now. I am past quota. Wow, way past quota. Uh, it's just 0.4 percent past quota, um, but past the hard quota. Um, all right, all righty. So uh, that is. One of those things where if you can never figure out why things are failing, then check your quota. Um, and I apologize for that oversight. Uh, we are running several uh, different uh, storms for the pre-implementation test right now, and I apparently am not running them anymore um, while I've been focused on Python training today. Uh, so I do apologize for that. Um, can't show you anything in the DTC area right now because I have nothing to uh, remove uh, at the moment, but these should be working um, for you guys if you want to submit them in this way. So um, I'm actually a little surprised that it let me uh, change the size of <laughs> my database um, and didn't complain. So um, I apologize for that. 
Um, but if you guys want to continue to email me to ask questions about submitting these things, if you're having problems with submitting them, and you do have this space available to you to write to, then um, definitely, uh, you know, let me know. I can help you get through these problems, and it's been fun debugging this one, and I hate that I am not prepared to do anything about fixing this problem, but we did find it. Um, so, uh, are there any other questions for what's going on today uh, at all? Um, I, I put one more slide at the end of this uh, slide set that just gives an overview of the kinds of things that we did. Sam had a really good slide that uh, set of slides that um, led to how to debug problems and, and get through uh, troubleshooting these types of things. And one of them we actually discussed last night was when things start failing in weird ways, like check your check your disk space, um, which is what happened here with us today. So, um, you know, if if there are any other questions or concerns after the call, feel free to email or, or submit a question to the help desk and uh, one of us will get back to you in the DTC. But I don't have anything else for today. Um, Sam, do you have anything else that you'd like to say? Uh, no. So I don't know how close we came to demonstrating the addition of a new job to the workflow. Uh, that is true. Uh, we did get all of the components in there. We set the um, we set the dependencies for a new job. We are able to run a job that did not exist before. Um, if you have enough disk space, you should be able to do that. I've done that in my area before I ran out of disk space. Um, if we do need to demonstrate additional components, um, sorry, I shouldn't use components there, additional aspects of adding a component to the workflow, um, I wouldn't be opposed to, you know, having a, an additional uh, maybe one hour session this time where we talk about doing uh, that more in depth uh, and, uh, and focusing on some things that people would like to focus on. Uh, beyond the scope of just this is how you do it in terms of adding a script and adding a Rakodo component. Um, also, if you want us to do that, it would be really great to, to suggest something that we could add <laughs> and, and not making me and Sam come up with this additional component on our own. Um, so being specific with requests like that is uh, is nice. Um, hopefully, hopefully that that covers uh, many of the things that you guys wanted to, to see today. And if not, please please let me know if there are topics that you're still curious about. Then I would definitely uh, be willing to entertain those topics um, at, at shorter sessions. I don't know that we have another full day session in the works at all or plan to, but um, we can definitely start supplementing some of these with shorter training sessions on very specific topics if uh, that is needed. So let us know what you need. All right. Um, that is all I have for today, and uh, Sam, if you don't have anything else, uh, people <laughs> should go and enjoy the snow safely, I suppose, or the rain if they're canoeing home this afternoon in Miami. Um, well, does anyone have any general questions about h work that we could answer? I'd I haven't heard any any speaking up. Nobody's chatting on the phone, so I I think that uh, that might be a no for now. So, um, wait um, a minute. Sure. Okay. Um, do you guys still know uh, next week the training is? You guys still be the the main talker next week, main speaker. Um. So the H work tutorial has a bunch of different uh, speakers. We have people, uh, developers who develop different components actually giving talks 
um, most of the day on Monday um, for uh, running the release. So it's kind of an overview session of the more so the scientific documentation that's available online. So we're talking uh, scientifically about all of the components of the H1 release and then uh, an overview of how to run with the wrappers, basically. Uh, we don't go into very much depth with the Python aspect of this. It's really just a how to run uh, with the wrappers kind of tutorial. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I guess I didn't answer the, the question. Sam and I will be giving some talks, but there will be plenty of other people giving talks as well. Awesome. All right. Um, now, are we, should I stop recording at this point? Yes, that would be great.